Um, after the first policy session, there will be two rooms available and in the thematic sessions, Zoom room one will continue with industry and heat and Zoom room two will proceed with electricity. You can easily switch between the Zoom rooms to listen to the topics you're most interested in. And uh, the second Zoom room will be available once the first policy session is over. My name is Dennis Kletzel, and I'm the new project manager at Berlin Economics Low Carbon Ukraine team. Low Carbon Ukraine is closely collaborating with Ukrainian experts and policymakers on all topics related to climate and energy. Low Carbon Ukraine is funded by the German Federal Ministry for Environment, Nature, Conservation and Nuclear Safety, also abbreviated as the BMU. This event is co-hosted by Dixie Group and uh, it's one of our leading uh, energy think tanks in Eastern Europe. A few words about the Low Carbon Ukraine projects. Um, as many of you might know, it started in 2018 and had many components. One of them were 10 discussions organized in 2020. Yes, sorry, can you speak in the English channel, please? Am I not? You're in the, uh, you did not select a channel, I see. Is, is everything? Yeah, is everything? Um, yeah, the project started in 2019 and had many components. One of them were 10 discussions uh, organized in 2020 on issues related to decarbonization and climate targets. So today's event is dedicated to the launch of the paper, which collects all thoughts and recommendations from these discussions. My colleague Olena Pavlenko uh, from the Dixie Group will guide you through the welcoming remarks and the rest of the policy session. But without further ado, welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Dennis. Dear colleagues, welcome to this webinar. In fact, it's a round table because we will be more than happy to hear your questions and your comments. With uh, no further delay, I would like to pass the floor for welcome and address to our representatives from the government. Mr. Uh, Roman Abramovsky, Distinguished Minister of Nature and Natural Resources. Roman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for organizing such a meeting. It seems that I hear some additional sound. So it's very nice to see that uh, such important problems are in the focus of attention. Many thanks to the LCU project for the support. Many thanks to Dixie Group. Ukraine has been already affected by uh, climate change the last year broke the record for Ukraine in terms of negative consequences of climate change. Last year, about 2.5 thousand uh, forest fires uh, occurred. This is much more than in the previous years. Uh, these uh, fires damaged about 263 uh, settlements. Agricultural manufacturers have been also negatively affected because they have experienced loss of yields. Ukraine has uh, undertaken to reduce CO2 emissions and mitigate climate changes because uh, but for these efforts, Ukrainian losses, Ukrainian damages will be growing and uh, these losses will amount to much higher um, figures than those needed to invest into climate change mitigation. 
For this reason, it is highly important to implement the climate change policy. The international community is getting ready for annual growth of temperature by 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. Ukraine has uh, supported the European Green Deal and for Ukraine cooperation with uh, Europe uh, will facilitate the achieving of ambitious climate targets under the Paris agreements in all sectors of policies. It is important for us to switch to other sources of generation to take measures of energy efficiency. They are critical and uh, these efforts should be accelerated. Uh, regarding energy efficiency, energy efficiency contributes to reduction of CO2 emissions as well as uh, contributes to overcoming energy poverty of the population. It would be possible not only to reduce greenhouse gas reduction, but also to achieve carbon neutral, energy efficient economy, which is our goal until 2030. And this goal is proclaimed in the national energy strategy until 2030. The ministry coordinates national efforts. Uh, we are negotiating our commitments uh, with the stakeholders. Ukraine is uh, very uh, responsible towards its climate goals. Now we are discussing reduction of uh, greenhouse uh, gases by 60% compared to 1990. In our opinion, this um, goal is feasible. It's quite ambitious, of course. Uh, the, this goal covers uh, many sectors such as uh, uh, green restoration. The color of investments, in my opinion, will be green in the nearest uh, decade. And it's very important to attract such investments into the energy sector. Because such investments uh, will help us achieve ambitious goals because Ukraine is a part of the global community and the European community. Our main goal is to achieve carbon neutrality. It might be the case in 2060. I will explain you why a large amount of investments have been um, uh, have been uh, required by Ukraine. Uh, previously, our deadline was 2020, 2050, and uh, now we see that uh, so many investments are needed and uh, we are not ready to appropriate them to change our economy at such a high pace. Therefore, Today's goal, today's deadline will be 2060. Of course, this deadline might change because we will increase our institutional capacity and capacity of business. The technologies uh, will become cheaper, then we will be able to adapt to these deadlines of achieving carbon neutrality. Thank you very much for your attention. I will be participating in the further session. I will be one of the speakers during the panel, and I wish all of us very constructive cooperation during this webinar. Thank you, Mr. Minister. We will be happy to discuss all the issues raised by you. We've got nearly 200 participants today. Indeed, uh, it's a very interesting mix of Ukrainian experts and international professionals. Hopefully today we will be not only discussing the problems, but also perhaps the solutions and some recommendations. And now let me pass the floor for welcoming address. Is it just me that cannot hear you? We can hear everyone. Please select the channel.
dear colleagues, if you have questions or you cannot hear, please send the messages to the chat and mute yourself. Let's continue. If you've got any questions, write them to the chat. So with that, let me pass the floor for the welcoming address to the Deputy uh, Minister of Energy, Mr. Maxim Namchinov. Thank you very much, Elena. First of all, I'd like to welcome all the participants on behalf of the Ministry of Energy. I would like to express my gratitude for organization of this event that contributes to implementation of our ambitious goals in the field of energy and climate. After the minister has spoken, I actually have nothing to say because he elaborated quite uh, sufficiently on the energy uh, development. But let me add a couple of words. First of all, I'd like to emphasize that to achieve energy sustainability, or we are working on updating strategic documents and development of a legislative framework. It's very important to keep the balance, which we've got at the moment, and uh, unfortunately, we observe uh, some uh, imbalances, but nonetheless, we have to restore the balance. Uh, this balance uh, should uh, cover the resilience of our system. There should be uh, equilibrium between our uh, economic targets and uh, harmonization, harmonization of our energy uh, sector. It's quite a complicated uh, objective. However, I think the goal is quite realistic. I'd like to say that today we are working on such documents as Integrated National Plan on Energy and Climate until 2030, uh, as well as uh, Energy Security very important documents uh, that are able to provide answers to many questions. We're also working on updating the energy strategy. From uh, It will uh, be intended for the period until 2050. Uh, the strategy is going to include forecast scenarios and uh, it will take into consideration the gaps of the previous strategy. We're also working on the smart grid concept, which is important for minimization of losses in the energy grids. Uh, then uh, the next document is the energy efficiency uh, plan until 2030, uh, which envisages reduction of consumption by 17%. We also actively uh, working on uh, the governmental orders related to this plan. Uh, the hydro economy roadmap is also uh, being developed with the support of the uh, World Bank. We are working on the hydro strategy of Ukraine, which envisages production and transportation of green hydrogen. At the moment, this technology is not developed enough in our country. There are questions about transportation and about storage of hydrogen for its use in the energy. Another important document I'd like to mention is the concept of a coal mining sector reform, especially state-owned mines. All state-owned mines are experiencing crisis period and uh, they inflict serious losses. Uh, we are also working on uh, the concept of uh, transformation of uh, coal mining uh, facilities. Uh, it is possible that large-scale privatization will be suggested. Let me emphasize once again this, uh, that this massive privatization does not mean that the coal mines will be privatized for continued production of coal. They can be privatized with no obligation to continue coal mining, so they will be used as infrastructure facilities. Also, 
developing uh, the state program for transformation of coal mining regions. The Ministry of Regional Development is in charge of this strategy, and yet our ministry has uh, joined uh, this uh, work. Actually, uh, the transformation of coal mining facilities and transformation of coal mining uh, regions are interconnected processes. We're also working on uh, NCE integration. Uh, we are eager to finish this process uh, by 2023. However, there are some issues yet uh, if maximum efforts are invested, it is possible to achieve this goal by 2023. Then I'd like to say that given the difficult situation in the energy market, the ministry has to uh, facilitate the balancing of electricity market. It is difficult to plan any energy efficiency measures with imbalances in the energy market. The market even uh, is not able to compensate for all expenditures. So the transformation of the natural gas market is also underway. At the moment, um, uh, we are uh, harmonizing Ukrainian legislation with the European one. We are making conditions for integration of energy systems of Ukraine with the EU system. We've got some uh, problems in the natural gas market, especially for households. In fact, uh, it's challenging to protect vulnerable groups of um, consumers. However, we are trying to address this issue very actively and hopefully in the beginning of the new heating season all groups of the population will be able to consume uh, gas at market prices if their income is not enough to cover uh, the uh, utility bills our state will provide the subsidies for target assistance at the moment i have to leave you uh, but i will come back for of the panel discussion. From now on, uh, Mr. Victoria Gnatowska and Mr. Alexandra Martinuk will be representing the ministry. I still hope that I will be able to join the discussion later on. Dear uh, Mr. Deputy, thank you very much. Today, uh, we have both positions of the Ministry of Energy and the Ministry of uh, Environment. That's we are working in two dimensions, the climate one and energy one. Hopefully we will be able to come up with some ideas and recommendations. We have the question in the chat. I promise you to collect these uh, questions and ask them later on. And first of all, let me pass the floor for presentation to Mr. Georg Zachman. Everyone knows him. This is a person who has worked a lot with U Ukraine in the field of energy reforms. And Mr. Georg is also known as uh, the uh, low carbon Ukraine uh, leader. The floor is yours. Yes, um, many thanks, Elena, and um, many thanks to uh, uh, Minister Pomovsky and uh, Deputy Minister Nemchino for their for their very kind words. Um, yeah, dear dear friends and colleagues, uh, I would have loved to to be with you today in Kiev in a, in a nice hotel and uh, discuss over some some sweets and coffee, uh, some some more the background of what we have been doing. Uh, but now we are just in another Zoom meeting. But I hope we uh, we can bring you across some of the uh, the work we have been doing in uh, in the last three years. Uh, first of all, I have to thank Dixie Group and the, and the entire LCU team for organizing not only this event, uh, but also for producing hopefully sort inspiring uh, content and helping to bring this content to, uh, to where it matters. And my special thanks has to go to, to Anastasia and Lucas. They did a great job in organizing this event. And if anything goes wrong, I have to take responsibility for that because I massively squeezed the amount of time they had available for, for organizing here. Um, 
So what I now want to talk about is um, uh, a report that uh, that we uh, released um, in the in the past week, and you can find it on the um, on the internet and uh, at our website lowcarbonukraine.com. And um, let me say a few words about this report at the beginning. So first, our feeling is that Ukraine has a lot of strategies and targets in the area of energy and climate policy, and I'll come to that later. And what we think is now important for Ukraine is to translate those strategies and targets into concrete policies. Because what Ukraine needs is not kind of uh, having, uh, having very, uh, uh, very nice targets that look like, uh, like European targets. But uh, what Ukraine needs is concrete policies that help to modernize the Ukrainian energy system, that help uh, people to afford their bills, and that help to ensure that, uh, that the lights don't go off and that the uh, air is not polluted. So what we did is we came up with 10 measures for the next 10 years, and I will give you a very short overview of, uh, of those 10 measures in a, in a minute. Now, this book has not been developed in Berlin. So it's not that we have been sitting in our office in Berlin and, and writing something that we thought might, fit for, uh, might be fit for Ukraine, but it was based on, a, uh, on an extensive stakeholder consultation process with Ukrainian experts and policymakers and co-authors. And so we, uh, we went essentially every month to Kiev uh, with, our, uh, with our team. We did mostly the, uh, the drafting, um, but we had uh, organized kindly by, uh, by Dixie Group, um, larger uh, stakeholder consultations, but we also had a lot of written feedback on the first drafts and, and bilateral exchanges. Now, all the material that, that will be presented only reflects the views of the authors at the end of the day. So not those of any Ukrainian or German ministry. So that's really only an LCU publication. But nevertheless, we are very grateful for the trust of the Ukrainian Ministry for, of Environment, the Ukrainian Ministry of Energy, and the German Ministry of Environment that allowed us to support them with analytical inputs, and sometimes even allowed us to um, constructively comment on the work that those ministries did. Um, and I'm, I'm also very happy about all the contributors that discussed with us and commented on our chapters. This helped us a lot in kind of making sure that what we are saying is grounded in the, in the reality of Ukraine and the reality of the energy sector, even so it sometimes appears quite ambitious. And um, a last word on the, um, uh, on, the, uh, on the book here is that we are currently preparing a Ukrainian translation of that. So we hope to have a translation of this book in the uh, um, uh, end of June, beginning of July. So uh, please have a look in our website, but we'll also circulate it via email, I presume. Now, Ukraine has a lot of energy and climate strategies, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and a lot of them are for 2030. And LCU was kindly allowed to, uh, to contribute to some of them. So LCU was allowed to contribute to the, um, uh, to the draft of Ukraine's first national energy and climate plan, which is uh, currently with the Ministry of Energy. And we hope to continue our discussion on, uh, on that uh, draft plan. Um, Ukraine has um, currently prepared its second nationally determined contribution. So the targets that Ukraine will communicate to the international community for the uh, Paris Agreement. And um, uh, LCU was, uh, 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 was kindly invited to, uh, to provide supporting material for that. But Ukraine has also a lot of other strategies. There is uh, the Ukraine Ergo planning for, uh, for generation adequacy and for 10-year uh, network development planning. And we will have a session today uh, with, uh, with the CEO of Okanergo. Um, Ukraine has, as uh, uh, Deputy Minister Nemchinov mentioned, a national energy efficiency action plan, a national renewable energy action plan. It, uh, it has an energy strategy for 2035 and plans to update it maybe to 2050. It will have a national emission reduction plan. The energy security strategy has been uh, mentioned by, uh, uh, by Deputy uh, Minister Nemchinov. So there is a lot of plans, but what we want to do is essentially to go from plans to, uh, to measures. And therefore, we have these 10 measures that we, uh, that we propose. Uh, the first one is 
Financing is at the core, we think, because investments is what is most needed in the Ukrainian energy and climate system. Um, so we need a plan to, uh, to finance policy measures, and we describe that in this paper. We have a plan for a carbon tax, and this is a quite ambitious one uh, to make Ukraine in line with, uh, with European carbon taxation or carbon pricing systems in the long term. That would help Ukraine to not fall under a carbon border adjustment. It would raise significant revenues. And we also include a lot of discussion on the social implications and how they can be mitigated. We have a plan on phasing out consumer subsidies in Ukraine. So um, um, currently, uh, electricity consumers pay too little money into the system to, uh, uh, to finance investments in the system. So the system is essentially aging and getting, uh, getting into more problems. So we need to find a way to, to finance a system also based on those consumers that can afford it. Um, we have a significant plan by, uh, uh, by my dear colleague, Mati Suponen, that will present it today on reforming the electricity market. Um, we, uh, we make a proposal on, um, uh, on how renewables can be deployed in a way that does not uh, uh, result in extremely high cost for consumers, but essentially in the long term reduces the cost for consumers. We propose something on synchronizing Ukraine's and Europe's electricity grids, which uh, Deputy Minister Nemchinov already mentioned as one of, the, uh, um, uh, one of the strategic directions of the country. Deputy Minister Nemchinov also mentioned that, uh, that the coal sector will undergo a significant reform in the future. And we think there is a, um, there is a substantial need for that. And we uh, came up relatively early with some ideas on, on how to do this. Um, then we think industry also matters in Ukraine. The steel sector is one of the most important sectors in Ukraine. So steel sector decarbonization in our view, can be, uh, can be already today supported by the, uh, by the Ukrainian government. Um, and further area of, uh, uh, of our research uh, looks into transport policies for Ukraine, where we think that, uh, that uh, currently there's, uh, um, it's, a, it's a bit of an area that is under, uh, underexplored, and I think more can be, can be done here to avoid mistakes that, uh, that European countries have done in the past and uh, very quickly already directly move into a sustainable solution. And finally, we think energy efficiency is key, and here we look into the building sector. Now, why, why did we choose exactly those 10 proposals? And, um, the problem is there are many more things that we can look into. And um, we can look into the gas sector that we have not dealt with. We can look into hydrogen. We can look into the chemical industry or agriculture. But we decided to come up with, uh, with ideas for sectors where we have some expertise and where we have very concrete proposals. So really small, uh, significant individual measures that will make a difference in our view. And, um, that is, the, uh, that is the whole thrust of the, uh, of the book. It's not like a list of uh, 2,000 proposals, but only 10, and therefore we had to, uh, had to choose. Um, as you can see, when you, when you look at that picture, electricity is something that is quite at the core of many of our proposals, because we think that the electric, uh, electricity is the main vector of decarbonization. Um, if you look into the latest International Energy Agency uh, report from yesterday, they base their decarbonization plans for, uh, for the world on massive electrification. And they look into the world, but Ukraine is part of the world. And Ukraine will be one country that also will see significant electrification in the, uh, in the future. So therefore, we think electricity market reform, for example, is, is at the core of a, of a sustainable energy system in Ukraine. But of course, electricity alone is not the answer to all of Ukraine's problems. Um, therefore, we also look into, into some other areas, and, but that's uh, to, to show that do, uh, those are there. Transport strategy, steel decarbonization, and energy efficiency. I already mentioned that, uh, that our thinking is that what Ukraine needs is investment. Um, Ukraine's energy system is completely underfinanced, but it's also under investing. And there are a lot of structural problems that are preventing that and high capital costs are a result and a cause for, uh, for too little investment. Um, so the plans that we, are, uh, that we are proposing try not only to spend money, but also think about where money can come from. 
So we think about how coal phase out might uh, essentially reduce subsidies, how a carbon tax might create revenues, and how a consumer subsidy phase out might uh, re uh, increase the income of the uh, uh, of the energy companies in order to be able to uh, to invest in all those nice things that you uh, that you see here on this picture. Um, but we cannot do that on the uh, on the back of uh, um, uh, of citizens that can uh, that are unable to afford that. Um, we know that Ukraine still is a relatively poor country in Europe. And therefore, we have to be very cognizant of the social implications, and we discuss them in our papers quite substantially, because we understand that uh, it does not make sense to increase tariffs to a level that people cannot pay them anymore, because that also does not create any revenues. And finally, um, I would like to, uh, to highlight that our proposals here are not only for the Ministry of Energy and the Ministry of Environment. We think modern energy and climate policy goes beyond those ministries. We have seen that in Europe, where the um, um, uh, <clears throat> energy union, for example, tried to broaden out um, energy and climate policy uh, to all uh, areas of, uh, of government policy making. So coal phase out will also be a discussion of min region in Ukraine. Carbon tax will be a discussion at the Ministry of Finance. Um, consumer subsidy phase out and uh, uh, and uh, change in subsidy systems will also be uh, uh, in the um, room of the Ministry of Social Protection. Um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, in our view, for example, will have to play a significant role in the discussions on synchronization with the European grid and so on. So with that, um, I can only tell you that today we are going to present in more detail six of them, uh, the proposals. Um, Matti Soponen will talk on electricity market, Clement Stieber on renewables, Lukas Feldhaus on uh, electricity grid synchronization. So that's the electricity room one. And then in room two, Manuel van Mettenheim will talk on coal phase out, David Shaha on steel sector, and Frank Meisner on uh, energy efficiency public building. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope I could tease a bit uh, what we have done here. I couldn't present all 260 pages, and uh, uh, but I hope we, we can have also bilateral discussions on that in the future. Thank you very much. So I have to stop sharing. Thank you, Georg. I think we have literally 15 minutes for Q&As. I repeat, if you have questions, you're welcome to ask them on chat while we have time, because we already have two questions. I will uh, present these questions and I'll perhaps ask Deputy Minister or perhaps Madam Ignatovska and Georg to try to answer these two questions already. So question one, is Ukraine focusing uh, on uh, EU climatic goals in its strategies? I think it's a rather easy question. Therefore, let's answer it now. Uh, second question, energy efficiency, sustainability, harmonization, security strategy. Given how often the leadership is changing in the Ukrainian government, how can we achieve all those goals? That second question that was raised here. I'll see if there are any more questions at the moment. Okay, I can't see any more questions. And if you do have them, please ask them. And if possible, I'd like to ask uh, Minister and de dear colleagues from the Ministry to answer these questions. So climatic goals, to what extent do they meet the EU goals and how can we achieve all those goals given how often the government is changing? Okay, let's start from the beginning. Do the goals meet the EU goals? Yes, they fully meet the EU goals because Ukraine also understands that it needs to achieve climatic neutrality. Unfortunately, there's no other way out. If we don't want to get critical temperatures already in 20 or 30 years, 
uh, the temperatures that will uh, disallow the people to stay in some uh, areas, say in Turkey, without air conditioning. Agri sector will change dramatically. And um, if we don't want to have that, uh, we need to find some way to achieve climatic neutrality. The EU climate goals. We are now discussing the Ukrainian uh, goals and the ability to change it, to change the technologies. Uh, nevertheless, we need to point out with our partners that uh, actually the Ukrainian goals without the absolute figures that are often mentioned by the businesses, by the public, Europe has taken on the commitments to reduce um, greenhouse gas emit com com emissions. Uh, and we have taken uh, 2017 as a baseline. Compared with today, we want to reduce emissions by 10%. By 2015, we want to reduce it by 24 four uh, percent if we want to compare this then obviously eight percent is less than the reduction compared with the current level but uh, we need to take into account the fact that ukraine has reduced emissions by more than 63 percent and this happened organically because um, industry has um, reduce its outputs. There were points, however, when the increase of uh, when the reduction of production um, did not cause any reduction in emissions. Organically, however, nothing else will, is going to happen. New approaches are offered to make sure that at some point, maybe five or 10 years later, we could adopt ambitious European goals and achieve uh, climatic neutrality. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, the number of questions is growing rapidly and we have very little time. If you may, please look at the questions on the chat and try to answer them on chat wherever possible. Representatives of the ministry and uh, members of low carbon Ukraine team will be there to assist. I will give floor to Maxim Viktoria Hnatovska, Ministry of Energy. Uh, please, if you could answer this, that would be great. I think Maxim is already has already gone to the next meeting. I would like to support. Uh, Minister of Environment and say that in 2020, basically, the Ukrainian government has publicly stated its readiness to um, participate in the European Green Deal and in all of our structural units that were drafted. And all of that will also in Ukraine, the peculiarities of the Ukrainian economy. I also believe this is a politician wants to um, go to the EU market, including the electricity market, because we're currently... Uh, considering the questions on the origins of electricity to make sure we have certificates of guarantees that it's uh, green energy so that after synchronization we could sell this specific electricity, green electricity with the certificates to the European Union. Uh, it uh, takes into account industry and production. the European Union will be setting up more stringent conditions. So we may say that all programmatic documents drafted by the Ministry of Energy 
are taking into account the component relating to a green deal, the European Green Deal. And we're talking about hard hydrogen energy because we're also considering a transition to hydrogen. And we know that hydrogen is basically environmentally neutral and its usage in industry and in transportation and in other spheres uh, could be quite beneficial. So uh, with answer to question as, as to whether or not we're taking this into account, yes, we do. And uh, we do take into account the strategic documents of the European Union. Thank you very much, Victoria. Georg, the floor is yours. Yes, so maybe on the uh, on the question of uh, of Ukrainian targets for for 2030, um, in our calculations, we think that um, the targets of minus 65 percent that are that are currently being discussed are um, both um, ambitious but also uh, quite realistic. And uh, in our calculations, we see that a significant share of the emission reduction would have to come from the electricity and heat sector. And we think that this is a um, um, relatively low cost way of, uh, of reducing emissions in, uh, in Ukraine and essentially uh, paving the way for um, um, for future investments and uh, and and sector stability. So uh, we have run our own electricity system model of the Ukrainian system, and one of the uh, one of the results, and I think that's well known in Ukraine, is that the that the current structure with the high share of uh, of, uh, of nuclear and and coal forces a lot of the coal-fired power plants to operate in order to provide flexibility. And they continue to, uh, to operate even in hours where enough other electricity would be there only to provide this flexibility. And we think that by, uh, by adding more other flexibility to the system and increasing the share of renewables, um, we could replace a lot of the essentially outdated existing coal-fired power plants. So uh, about two thirds of the coal-fired power plants that are, that are currently in existence in Ukraine might actually not be needed technically. And, uh, uh, and other coal-fired power plants might also uh, change the mode of, their, uh, mode of their operation. And when one does that, the increase in cost is relatively limited in the, in the short term. And in the long term, Ukraine will come up with a, with a power system that is characterized by, by lower emissions, but also by, by new power plants that, uh, that can be there in, in Ukraine for the, uh, for the foreseeable future. And, um, that uh, uh, that is, uh, also reduces potentially the, the price in Ukraine because more competition in the Ukrainian market that is currently characterized by a high degrees of uh, concentration could bring down the cost. So therefore, this idea of um, uh, achieving minus 65 percent uh, by 2030 does not strike us as, uh, as unrealistic. But what needs to be done is that essentially all parts of the, uh, of the government need to move into that direction. And uh, I understand that this is, a, uh, that it, this is indeed a challenge and uh, our, uh, our ideas should contribute to, uh, to make the case here. Thank you, Gerga. We've just just about three minutes. I would like to use them for another round of Q and A's. There are so many questions. I'm so sorry we cannot ask them all. I'll just ask two of them. And dear speakers, please be brief. You've got only thirty to forty seconds for answer. So the first question is quite provocative. Is it uh, realistic to? achieve decarbonization until 2050 instead of 2060? Yes or no? And the second question is about the regions. Is it planned to focus on the development of decarbonization at the level of the particular regional programs, strategies, and other strategic documents in the regional dimension? Mr. Minister, let me answer the first question and the, the second question will be answered by other colleagues. Yes, it is fully realistic. 
another question is whether we should undertake to achieve this goal. I think not. We should to be guided by uh, the readiness of Ukraine, by Ukrainian challenges, by the cost of technologies, by the situation, the armed conflict. Indeed, uh, we are in quite a unique situation. Then we have to consider the cost of capital and so on. There are lots of uh, conditions which we should reflect in our um, strategic documents. It is possible to achieve uh, uh, neutrality until 2050. However, we do not have uh, the economic prerequisites for this uh, goal. The number of investments uh, is huge. Uh, the largest amount of investments should be made uh, within five to seven years. Uh, last years before achieving the goal. I'm not sure whether we are able to get these investments to attract them. But as soon as the situation changes, as soon as the technologies become cheaper, we will be able to change the deadline, perhaps. So briefly, that was it. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Ms. Victoria, please comment about decarbonization about 2050 and about decarbonization at the level of regional development. I think that the first question was answered by Mr. Roman. I fully agree with him. Regarding the second question, I think uh, that the regional development should be approached by means of a, a set of uh, energy efficiency measures, including uh, renovation, reconstruction of buildings, reconstruction of uh, uh, heating uh, power stations. We know that the heating uh, sector is especially crucial because uh, without uh, the heating, uh, the heating season will fail in the regions. At the same time, the heating companies should strive to environmental neutrality. At the moment, uh, there is a, a, such a useful mechanism as a green bonds. Uh, we are working now on the law, on implementation of the law adopted to launch the green bonds. I think that uh, the decarbonization fund should be in operation because that's the very mechanism which allows the regions to take the decarbonization measures in the sector of industry and transportation, as well as many other industries. This will be the uh, state program, by the way. And additionally, we've also dealt with the issue of costs at our meetings we've heard many times that the uh, uh, money that uh, the royalties uh, received as a result of the uh, production in the region should be streamlined to the budgets of uh, the regions and uh, these funds can be also used for decarbonization. So in my opinion, uh, a, lot, a lot of measures can be taken, but at uh, different levels, not only in some particular sector of industry, of economy. Thank you. Georg, you've got 40 seconds and no more for these uh, final words. Uh, thanks, Elena. Um, on the um, on the carbon pricing, so uh, both in the EU and I think also in Ukraine, it would make sense to uh, to make use of carbon pricing revenues in order to uh, um, um, to modernize the uh, the Ukrainian um, energy and um, energy system and the uh, and industry. Um, I think with uh, a good governance system. Uh, that uh, that protects um, against corruption. It would be quite interesting to uh, um, to have 
a corresponding fund potentially also supported by international donors. But that is something I think we should discuss at another event, and I would be very much looking forward to uh, to have this uh, this discussion separately soon. Thank you. Thank you, Gerg. Thank you, dear speakers, for this goal-oriented discussion. Now we have to finalize uh, our panel because at 10 past 11 in five minutes, the next panel will be taking place. It will be about decarbonization in the steel sector. Let me remind you that in parallel, there will be another panel dedicated to the energy market. Now you see in the chat the link to join the second breakout room. Dear participants, you are free to select your topic. You can either stay here or join the breakout room. There will be discussion about reforms of energy markets. And then we will continue discussion. Let me remind you that in the chat, you will get the links to all the discussions that are going to be held later. Thank you very much. Now five minutes of break and at 10 past 11, we will see each other here again. And the next moderator will be Anton. See you. Thanks, Olena. See you.
Good morning, dear colleagues. Let us resume our event. Welcome once again to the webinar dedicated to discussion of climate and energy goals of Ukraine. And this particular section is dedicated to decarbonization of Ukraine's steel sector. A low carbon Ukraine project is a part of the European climate initiative. It is supported by the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature, Conservation, and Nuclear Safety. Uh, the uh, project is um, uh, implemented by Berlin Economics. My name is Anton, I'm from Dixie Group, and I will be moderating this session. Let me explain you first some housekeeping issues. Today, we've got simultaneous interpreters, and we are grateful to them for being able to hold the discussion in both languages simultaneously. If you need interpretation, please find the globe icon press upon it and select English or Ukrainian channel. If you need Ukrainian interpretation, you have to select the Korean language because there is no Ukrainian flag in Zoom. So please select the appropriate channel. So for Ukrainian interpretation, you need the Korean channel once again. Select the channel, select the language. I will be working in the Ukrainian channel, but I will be switching from one to another. Just hold on a second, please. If you cannot find the list of participants and technical support, Support. And in the chat, you see some instructions on how to see that. I hope everyone has selected the channel and interpreters can work now in full operation. So let's continue. If you have any questions, you can submit them to the chats, to the chat. Please be respectful, respect all the participants of the discussion. We are ready to accept the questions during the entire event. However, the speakers will be able to answer them in the end during the Q&A session. Please stay with us until the end of the meeting. If there are any technical issues, the quality of uh, image, quality of sound, please approach technical assistance. Miss Anastasia is ready to help you. And now let me tell you about the polling. Today we will be discussing not only through uh, questions and answers through lectures, through speeches given by our speakers, but uh, we will have some interactive part. In the chat, you will see uh, the link to Slido service. So you will have to visit slido.com website. Then you will have to enter the code 222, triple two, and then you will be able to provide your answer. Hold on a second, I will show you how it looks like. Question number one, in your opinion, how much focus should be put to decarbonizing the steel sector compared to other sectors? This is the training question. It's a little bit funny. So again, let me reiterate how much focus should be put to decarbonizing the steel sector compared to other sectors. We've got just a couple of seconds more to answer. 
So how much focus should be put to decarbonizing the steel sector compared to other sectors? You can answer this question by either scanning the QR code or by visiting the... Дякую. Дякую. Думки розділилися, але я бачу більшість голосів все ж таки. Apple too. We see that the opinions differ. Most answers are concentrated in the right part of our table. And now let's proceed to the second part of our question. Until when can Ukraine fully decarbonize its steel production, in your opinion? This is again the multiple choice question. We know uh, the background. We have an idea of the practical dimension. So please answer until when can Ukraine fully decarbonize its steel production? And again, you can visit the website slider.com and you can also scan the QR code. Excellent. 2040 ranks one. 2050, we see the same number of answers of votes for 2050. Okay, now let's make a pause. I'm stopping sharing my screen. So now we are ready to start. Oh, we have invited distinguished experts, Mr. David Sacher, representative of uh, LCU, Mr. Max Hoffman, the expert in steel work, and uh, also the uh, representative of uh, GMK Center. We'll start with the presentation uh, by David Sacher. David, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and uh, to discuss uh, with uh, some excellent experts, both on the panel and I'm sure in the audience as well. Um, the paper and the policy proposals on uh, decarbonization in the steel sector have been developed in the last year. And uh, within the context of this book, I would like to stress they're sort of intended also as an example uh, for an industrial sector, because of course, uh, as Georg mentioned earlier, uh, not all industrial sectors could be covered in this project, but the steel sector is uh, a particularly in uh, interesting one because um, carbon emissions are not just a byproduct of heat required in the process, but they're quite imminent in the, in the production process of steel, uh, and they're used ac actually more for their chemical purposes than, than for, for, uh, for thermal properties. So um, that's why we uh, consider the steel sector to be particularly important uh, uh, to look at as uh, what is usually really regarded as one of the hardest challenge in decarbonization, just because of the imminence and the uh, intrinsic importance of, uh, of using uh, uh, stuff that essentially leads to carbon dioxide uh, emissions in the process of producing steel. So um, onto the first slide, please. My, my colleague uh, Ruben uh, is uh, so kind as to um, turn the pages for me. So if we could move to the first slide. Uh, yes, we have, um, I would like to basically start with a brief review of where the steel sector stands in Ukraine and then sort of look at the decarbonization options, the technical ones, uh, the challenges of it, and then move to our set of policy proposals that uh, with a little sort of illustrative uh, scenario, what which we think shows the potential and which then should be discussed uh, as to its realism, as to its level of ambition, whether that should be larger or smaller. That's basically the idea for this presentation. So uh, the Ukrainian steel sector remains a very important industrial sector of Ukraine, 12% of GDP. I think this, these are 2019 figures because the presentation and the paper was done last year. Um, 600,000 employees, 23% of Ukraine's goods exports, and of course also a concentration in uh, what are generally relatively challenged areas of Ukraine, the eastern uh, especially, and also the southern region of the country. The steel sector has, as we see in the graph, is sort of fluctuated uh, in terms of its output. Uh, and the reason is really that, of course, it's a, it's a global commodity market. Uh, the steel sector is exposed to a world market price uh, that it has to take. Um, 
and with the world market price, as well as, of course, other major events uh, happening in Ukraine, such as the conflict in the east, which resulted in the loss of a few plants. But also the, the main thing really is that the steel price, the global steel price fluctuations sort of dictated uh, also the reactions of the output, simply because some plants would not be very profitable anymore at, at lower price. And of course, there were some surprises uh, that, especially with the advent of China as a big supplier, the prices uh, came down in the... Uh, around the 2005 uh, year and the following years. So basically the sector has been in a bit of a challenge uh, since then. Um, and uh, that's uh, that's basically the economic situation that uh, now, of course, we, we see uh, last year with very high uh, steel prices, uh, surprisingly to many. Steel output, interestingly, hasn't, uh, hasn't really changed. I think that's probably largely due to some uh, outages uh, in the beginning of the year. But uh, the steel prices have recovered substantially, and of course, that uh, brings more cash into a sector that often uh, is, has not been so cash uh, rich in the last years. But uh, it is, of course, uh, unforeseeable whether that is the situation that's going to last or not. Next slide, please. Um, so on to the technologies, of course, the, the emissions come from the technologies. And here is where we have in Ukraine a situation with a relatively old technology mix. Firstly, uh, and that's basically in line where most of the world is, uh, Ukrainian steel making uses the integrated route. Uh, that's sort of the combination of a blast furnace and then a basic oxygen furnace. The first stage always is the reduction of the iron oxides to iron, and then uh, essentially it's being converted into proper, proper steel in the second stage. Um, that's a very rough description, and the technical experts can certainly do that much better, but uh, I think that's basically the, uh, the idea. And uh, that accounts for 70% uh, of Ukrainian crude steel production and 2019. That's relatively in line with the global average. Um, then there comes 24% uh, of uh, a combination of blast furnace and uh, um, open hearth furnace, which is really very old technology, and that's only being used anymore in uh, ex-Soviet countries. Uh, that's relatively unusual. And then only on third place with 5.5% uh, of production is uh, another route that is using essentially a relatively emissions unintensive uh, electric arc furnace to convert uh, to recycle scrap steel. That's basically not a primary steel production. It's using mainly scrap steel and only a relatively low content of uh, new steel, but uh, this is a relatively emissions unintensive um, route for producing steel. And that's uh, only, yeah, about 5%, that's relatively small in Ukraine. So basically what we see is that there is a high reliance on production of primary steel uh, in coal and coke intensive uh, methods, a small share of the uh, less emissions intensive um, scrap steel and uh, the reason is also that uh, scrap steel in ukraine is not in, in in large supply it's it's always a question whether you have sort of sources of scrap such as uh, scrapping yards for ships or decommissioning of industrial plants and uh, in ukraine that is basically not uh, said to be the case right now what's important about the steel sector in general of course is that the asset base is very old that is a testament to the high capital costs in ukraine it's expensive uh, to get a credit. Very often you don't get a very long credit with a long maturity, so it's hard uh, to invest in new equipment and therefore in the steel sector, as in many other heavy industrial uh, areas of Ukraine or in the energy production, we see uh, an asset base that has a high rate of fully depreciated assets and relatively low investment. Next page, please. Um, so as to the emissions of the sector, it is a very emissions intensive sector. 17% of Ukrainians CO2 emissions by its own emissions inventory, which is um, uh, debatable, um, comes from uh, CO2 emissions. Um, this is not uh, fully compliant with the EU uh, guidelines for em uh, emissions monitoring. We did some sort of uh, own estimation using standard factors uh, of what the uh, CO2 emissions of the steel sector were, and even with a relatively conservative calculation method, we arrived at a, at a far larger number of 47 megatons of CO2 per year. So a very substantial emissions um, component coming from the steel sector. And the main reason, of course, is, okay, is um, is that uh, the integrated route, these uh, standard methods of producing steel from blast furnace and then either a basic oxygen furnace or an open hearth furnace, um, are simply because they produce uh, they uh, they need the ox uh, the, uh, 
they need uh, to produce uh, carbon dioxide emissions in reducing the iron down, uh, they are very emissions intensive. And that's really where the emissions come from. So what are the options to, uh, to decarbonize steel? There are basically uh, options on three levels, uh, which we see. First of all, production processes can be optimized, such as an um, increase of the scrap component, which is always sort of mixed into the, um, uh, the mix uh, in primary steel making. There could be a usage of higher quality iron ore or coal. Um, not all of that is very easy to do because sometimes these uh, the the quality of the inputs required would be uh, foreign rather than domestic. The advantage is there's a limited investment, no investment cost. There's simply some higher opex, uh, but of course the potential for abating emissions is relatively limited. Um, secondly, of course, there are retrofits. Uh, so it's basically the idea of sort of putting filters or carbon capture units onto the um, uh, onto the steel plants. The main method here usually cited is pulverized coal injection, uh, which uh, improves the energy efficiency of the base uh, of the blast furnaces and has a relatively quick amortization. On the other hand, uh, as far as we know, most of the Ukrainian blast furnaces already do have this installed. So also these uh, retrofits, of course, they can reduce the, uh, to some extent, uh, the CO2 emissions intensity, but it cannot uh, fully get it down. Carbon capture and storage is always debatable in itself. I will not go further into that debate. Um, so there is also, of course, some possibility from retrofits, but it's not, um, it's not that major in our view. The real deal in the end, if, if this sector is to be uh, decarbonized, has to be replacements of plants with a different technology. And there are basically two main options right now. One is to sort of increase the uh, usage of the scrap EAF route, so the production of steel from scrap, which is not uh, that simple, but uh, simply because of the availability of steel. But then, because it uses uh, not a basic oxygen furnace, but an electric arc furnace, so it uses electrical energy for the second stage, this could be used from uh, uh, renewable from green energy sources, and that would have the the option, uh, the possibility to actually produce uh, relatively clean steel, but it needs the scrap. What is uh, the most uh, frequently discussed thing in, in, in such circles at the moment, I think, is uh, the replacement of the first stage, uh, where now the blast furnace is, with a different uh, sort of technology that is under development right now, and that's called direct reduced iron, and that basically uses natural natural gas uh, or biogas or hydrogen uh, as a reducing agent to, to reduce uh, the iron uh, the oxides from the iron oxides and that basically would have the option especially when it's uh, being used when what is being used is um, green hydrogen so hydrogen produced from uh, say green energy uh, or green electricity that would have essentially the pot technological potential to reduce the uh, carbon dioxide emissions of the sector to, uh, to a very, very small figure. Such plants are being rolled out right now. Uh, I think uh, recently, um, I just read an article in The Economist where a plant in the no in north of Sweden was uh, cited. So I'm also glad that Max Amon will uh, be discussing with us from Lund in Sweden uh, the potential of these sectors. The question is very much uh, to uh, how ready are such technologies right now? And uh, I'm happy to discuss that later. But that's essentially probably the most promising technological route with the question of when is it really available for a rollout in a country like Ukraine when most of the plants right now are still considered pilot technology. So what should be done in the end? I think we, we see there are some alternatives. Uh, the most promising ones are, have still a bit of a question mark uh, with regard to when they're ready. But uh, what, are the, what are the main challenges there for, for Ukrainian? I think, first of all, we mentioned that uh, it's a bit of lack of clarity which technology and how exactly it will be deployed and when it's ready. Then, of course, there's the question of incentives for the steel makers. Uh, there is a low um, tax uh, on carbon uh, at the moment. Uh, that's basically not uh, sufficient in our view to incentivize uh, major investment. And of course, there's always the problem that policy is sometimes not very predictable. So you're not necessarily sure whether a policy that is being announced will, will last uh, through the next few political changes. At the same time, there is a challenge on the horizon, which is the potential for e the e other country, which is the decarbonization of their steel production, uh, to actually in um, install uh, carbon border taxes. Uh, and that could basically shut out Ukraine from markets that uh, are basically uh, then limited to uh, 
green steel or slash tariffs on onto the uh, old dirty steel. That, that that would of course be a major could be a major source of concern if Ukraine unless you um, steel production and these uh, taxes are being implemented. Finally, uh, capacity. Can the steel makers, even if they want to invest, can they invest? Uh, there are high capital associated around one bin, uh, which we figure for replacement of technology of uh, one megaton of coal making capacity. It's one billion uh, euro of investment. Uh, that's our estimate. Uh, so that's that's quite substantial. We were talking about a few billions here. And um, then uh, the profitability of the steel sector, of course, depends on the world market price. So you, it's hard to uh, uh, to be sure of your profits in the coming years. And of course, the very Ukrainian situation is the difficult access to capital, and that that really needs to be taken into account. So in this policy, what what are the important are uh, three uh, three things that is um, first of all, they should be technology neutral, so they should not set uh, which technology to be used. Should be the recovery of the uh, of the market. Uh, they should also be, of course, highly reliable in so far as that they pro provide sufficient guidance for the long investment horizons that are necessary. Then the investments and capacity for the steel makers at the same time. So uh, there is the risk if simply the investment, uh, the incentives are strengthened through um, taxes, capacity to actually make the investments that are necessary, and that, that really. For turning to the policy measures, uh, what we suggest is basically a mix. And that first of all, uh, to strengthen the incentives, uh, we suggest to uh, phase in a higher uh, carbon dioxide tax uh, comparable to EU levels, which is also intended as a, a sort of preemption of possible carbon uh, border adjustment mechanisms. So it would basically make sure the, uh, the Ukrainian steel is not subject uh, to such, um, such a, a tariff. And the idea would be to increase this to a level of uh, 39 euros per ton by 2050. 2050 sort of, uh, and that's really up for discussion, as uh, a time limit by when uh, full decarbonization is realistic. So that uh, it's a special case, um, this carbon di uh, tax for the uh, for the steel sector of what is being uh, suggested in, other, in another paper here, uh, which is an economy-wide introduction by, uh, by 2030 of the same level of carbon tax. And basically the idea was, it's not fully realistic that steel can decarbonize by 2030 fully. Therefore, we need to shift the date. And we thought 2050, but that's really up to, de uh, up to debate and uh, what's in, in terms of what's realistic. Um, then there should be a modernization fund. Uh, we argue this is, uh, this is just an idea for now, but uh, it is important in our view to strengthen the capacity uh, of the steel makers. It's uh, poor investment support, putting on a carbon tax will weaken uh, steel producers because they will have to pay to some extent. And the question is, can some of this money be uh, given back in order to help them strengthen the, uh, their investment capacity? And that's what the idea uh, in such fund is. Uh, would you expect uh, revenues of the carbon tax to co-fund investments into reducing CO2 emissions intensity. That, of course, should be designed in a proper way with international partners in a very reliable way. There should be some uh, ideas about front-loading of resources, but uh, the main idea is to couple this uh, CO2 tax with, uh, with a fund instrument that supports investment. That's really at the heart of our policy proposal. Then we have on the next page some further, I think in, in, in the interest of time, I will not go through these, uh, but there is the, the idea to improve credit conditions um, lower, uh, for uh, emission reducing in, uh, investments. There is the idea of providing more um, certainty uh, for investors in green electricity with long-term electricity contracts. And electricity, of course, as Georg mentioned, it will be also crucial here because uh, producing steel from uh, this direct reduced uh, iron EAF through electric arc furnace route will, uh, in the end, require a green electricity in order to be carbon neutral because it will use electricity first that, to then produce hydrogen or, or just electricity to produce the steel. So green electricity is essential here. And then, of course, there should be an integrated strategy that ties together the different ends. 
they do this year's hydrogen and that. So the idea for the Bessie proposal, what we did here, and that's maybe as a start for the debate, is uh, an illustrative uh, scenario to see is a, real, uh, is a decarbonization of this sector by 2050 feasible in terms of when does the tax increase, the tax increases uh, up to uh, basically 39 euros by 2050, and what sort of emissions reductions are necessary, what invests are necessary, and uh, how much tax burden is there. What we find is that essentially the tax, uh, by assuming some sort of tra a trajectory of how the emissions are being reduced, first relatively slowly because the, you know, uh, many of the technologies are not there or not available for Ukrainian producers, um, and then with an increasing rate, and I think from uh, 2035 with a relatively fast rate because we assume by that time really uh, this DRI, the direct reduced iron using hydrogen and EAF route is uh, available for commercial usage in a very wide scale. By that time, we think the major investments can be done before actually or just when the tax hits, uh, it uh, starts hitting higher uh, rates. And uh, what we find is here that in the end, over this uh, entire space, we have tax revenues of around 12 billion. And that is quite interesting because 12.4 uh, 12 billion is basically half of the investment that is being required in the steel sector, according to our calculations. So to fully decarbonize the steel sector, we basically uh, calculate Ukraine needs to replace 25 megatons of steel making capacity per year, uh, no, basically 20, 25 megatons per year making capacity. And that costs about 1 billion euros per uh, megaton. So 25 billion, uh, I think, well, uh, this is in, in dollars actually, but $25 billion investment is being required. Uh, putting that together with 12.4 uh, billion euros uh, in tax revenues, it basically gives us that half of the money that's required in terms of investment would already be there in tax revenues. So considering the combination of a carbon dioxide tax, which strengthens uh, the incentives, and a fund instrument that sort of supports investments and therefore strengthens incentives and capacity at the same time, there would be sufficient money to actually strengthen this fund, to support this fund and to support the, uh, the investments. That for us is the interesting uh, takeaway from this. Uh, we think there is technology that is highly promising. Um, the question is really when is it available, but we see that the combination of, uh, of a tax and a fund instrument would basically, in our view, be a very promising candidate to support uh, and strengthen the incentives and capacity at the same time to really unlock the investments. And maybe as a closing note, I would like to also mention it's important for Ukraine not to be too late in this. Um, it's important to get the timing right because being too late in the end would mean other countries have decarbonized and Ukraine could potentially really start being locked out of the market because it has not modernized its asset base. So getting the timing is right, uh, right is essential, but I think what, uh, what we learned from here is that the combination of policy instruments seems very promising to affect uh, what is necessary to complete this major task. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I would like to remind our uh, audience that you can ask your questions on chat. We will try to answer them following the panel discussion. Please don't forget that option. Now I'd like to ask our experts and to comment uh, the presentation of Mr. Saha Max Aman, expert in metallurgy, Dean of uh, Lund University. The floor is yours, Max. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to present at this occasion. And thank you for the report. Uh, I've read it with great interest. So, uh, <clears throat> which technologies are available and what is happening in the steel industry? Uh, I've been working with steel uh, the past 12 years uh, and also with zero emissions of actually attaining zero emissions for the steel sector. And I remember when I talked to the Scandinavian steel makers in uh, 2010 and said, by 2050, you need to go to zero emissions. They had upfront answers saying, no, it's not possible. It will never happen. Uh, a lot of things have changed since that. That's sort of, the, I've also learned that that's the sort of normal reaction from an industry when the policymaker comes and asks you, 
should you sort of reduce your emission? They would say no. But of course, and uh, the past five years has seen a tremendous quick development, mostly in Europe, but now also spreading to the rest of the world of several options now that are plausible and technically with no problems actually to decarbonize the steel sector. Of course, uh, hydrogen direct reduction with renewable hydrogen is one of them. It's the perhaps now uh, most discussed in Europe. Uh, you also have carbon capture and storage, CCS with biomass, which is also uh, a still a viable option. And it's not, and none of these options sort of requires a fundamental research developments. It's all about integration and uh, into existing plants and demonstration plants. And it's all about getting them going. You have some other options that are still on a pilot and research and development uh, level, and that would be electrowinning or molten oxide electrolysis. Uh, these will take a couple of years before they will be confirmed. But uh, hydrogen direct reduction or CCS, uh, and I would also actually account for Hisana uh, technology, would be a, is roughly available. And uh, there are several demonstration plants being planned and being developed as we speak uh, to be, begin operation within the next three to four years in Europe. So uh, with that said, I would say by uh, 2030, there will, there will definitely be a lot of options from the Ukrainian steel industry to invest in if they want to, the technology will be proven. Uh, <clears throat> another thing that I should mention here, of course, is which of these technologies will prevail which one will be the winning well i think both of them probably but uh, what decides is of course the uh, input cost of the main constituencies the, the main inputs into this two technologies hydrogen direct production requires quite a lot of low cost electricity and of course that points to the ukrainian need to reform the electricity market to get a good pricing for industrial electricity uh, whereas CCS, of course, uh, depends on also low cost coal, but also on a lot of techni technical uh, things like storage and regulations to actually manage this. Uh, so the jury is still out, but at the moment, uh, I think hydrogen direct production is definitely the one most discussed in Europe at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, yes, and then of course, consider you said, uh, I like the idea of putting a carbon tax of uh, climbing up to 39 euros per ton of carbon. Uh, just let me remind you that the current price in EVTS is now above 50 euros per ton. Uh, so, I mean, in Europe already seeing this effect of a high carbon price, it's also part of the explanation why there's such a strong mo momentum in trying to decarbonize steel and all other sectors as well. With high carbon price, it becomes profitable. That's also the reason why the now is uh, a carbon border, border tariff that will affect Ukraine as well. And that is also mentioned in the report. And I think that's something you should consider very carefully, the risk that if you do not show the same or not the same, but at least a similar kind of ambition in Ukraine, you might, your steel industry might become disadvantaged or even locked out from the European market. And that would not be a good situation and wouldn't be good for Europe as well. The steel, global steel market in general has a problem of overcapacity that also needs to be dealt with. So uh, the steel market in itself, it's in a tough spot right now. Uh, okay, um, I will leave it at that, that and leave it up to the next panelist or back to Anton and uh, to direct further and take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amon. And before we continue our discussion, let me remind all our participants uh, 
and viewers that uh, the questions can be and should be asked in the chat. Please join our discussion. Now I'm very happy to welcome Mr. Stanislav Zinchenko, the Jim Key Center Director. Mr. Stanislav, I'm sorry, could you please switch to English speaking channel because uh, we hear sorry, both interpretation sorry, yes, I... and your speech at the same time. Okay, I'm in English speaking. Sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry. Uh, I must start from... Anybody hear me before? Okay. Decarbonization of steel industry, first of all, will require in Ukraine and in the world supply, supply of carbon neutral energy. Every expert, every steel uh, producers tell the same. For uh, uh, decarbonized steel, for green steel, we need green energy and with normal price. Green electricity is a necessary condition for green steel production. Now the prospect of low carbon electricity production in Ukraine, in Ukraine are not clear. The electricity market is significantly uh, misbalanced with very high renewable tariffs and many debts accumulated in the system. Now it's no more than 12%. I, th uh, I think uh, uh, the sh uh, share of uh, green uh, energy production in Ukraine. We should remember that CO2 reduction potential is limited for existing BF uh, road. Uh, and it's, it's necessary to develop new technology and uh, the most of them are not major today. Research organization will have much to do to develop state-of-the-art low-carbon technologies for steel production. Equipment manufacturer and engineering company must start to find technical solutions to commercial commercialize new technologies. And it's only on starting this way. That's why this optimistical voting is uh, for me like a joke. Uh, we are in, uh, we keep in touch with more than uh, 20 biggest uh, technology and R&D project in decarbonization. And they are only on start. It's not clear which decarbonization technology we will win in steel sector. Uh, experts say that it will be clear in 2030 only will be clear which technology can be used. Uh, and it's, it's very important not to restrict our review by one technology. Uh, now it's possible to cut slightly CO2 emissions through implementation of energy efficiency measures and using more quality raw materials. I agree with David. But considering importation of raw materials, it's, it's also necessary to understand carbon footprint of maritime shipping, for example, which can prove to be quite big. Ukrainian steel companies also have limited possibilities to increase scrap usage uh, that was told before. Uh, and uh, the state uh, now about uh, financing of decarbonization. The state as a system of official institutions plays a special role in the decarbonization process. All tools of economic policy are centered in the hand of the state. Hence, a pace and effectiveness of decarbonization depend on its actions. In the report, carbon tax is considered as the best instrument to stimulate decarbonization in Ukraine. Uh, first of all, I'm not agree with uh, tax as the stimulus of investment. It doesn't work in business, guys. However, there are other ways to introduce carbon price. For example, emission trading shame. As per the association agreement with you, Ukraine has committed to introduce a new like emission trading shame. We uh, found that in EU steel plants implemented decarbonization projects without big fiscal burden related uh, to CO2 price. Uh, the main European stimulus for decarbonization is state financing and co-financing of many projects. In EU steel plants may use different instruments of state financing, loans, grants, compensation of capex and opex, tax vacations and others. There are several institutions for financing decarbonization in EU. Now it's uh, more of uh, 10 
uh, institution with focus of steel industry decarbonization. The European, European financial sources for decarbonization now is almost 800 billion euro for coming decade. So the idea of attracting financial resource for decarbonization in Ukraine is right. Sources and condition of financing are subject for separate discussions. I fully agree. Uh, we understand it's impossible to decarbonize, to decarbonize Ukrainian steel sector using only one modernization fund. I'm sure and I agree it can be 10 funds, five institutions, uh, using of international uh, uh, financing and technological support. Ukraine make efforts to follow European trends and it's very important on this path not to repeat the others mistakes and adopt only the best and most effective methods and techniques uh, that Europe Europe use uh, European Union is ahead of Ukraine in terms of decarbonization this enable our country to have the best unique European experience we are industrial country in Ukraine and we hope it will remain in this status as a partner of European Union uh, to this end, uh, the decarbonization process must be constructive, not destructive, because when it's only one goal to decarbonize, to decarbonize steel industry, we can close steel industry in Ukraine. And uh, as was told before, uh, on the market is overcapacity and everybody will be happy, not will be happy Ukrainian uh, government. Uh, because uh, uh, st our steel industry is 35% of export, 12% of GDP. So we believe decarbonization can create conditions for emergence and development of new companies, new sectors, new jobs in Ukraine, but with uh, the same instruments that Europe have uh, has. So state co-financing, funds, and so other. And uh, I can tell you uh, the figures that we have that uh, every year uh, Ukrainian steel company invest uh, from 800 till one and one billion dollar uh, in capital investment in, ca in capex and uh, for in, uh, invest in decarbonization uh, uh, about, uh, on ground of this BF both technology uh, experts said that we will need one thousand dollar per ton of steel uh, investment. So we will need more than 25 billion dollars additional to invest in. But nobody know till the end in which technology. So uh, uh, we uh, we are in touch with Ukrainian steel companies. We know uh, the decarbonization plans and uh, investment plans. And uh, we understand that next five, 10 years on existing technology, it's possible to uh, reduce CO2 emissions uh, 20, 30 percent. Uh, but it will be need additional three, four billion dollars. Nobody know where it will be, uh, where companies will find this additional three, four billion dollars. You understand it's not uh, it's very big amount in Ukraine. So uh, now uh, I, I want to tell so about the year, the end of my speech. Uh, many companies said that they will decarbonize uh, themselves uh, till 2050. So uh, for example, when uh, ArcelorMittal, Thyssen Group, Tata Steel, Voice Alpina, Hyundai Steel, Posco, Nippon Steel, United States Steel say 2050, it will be 100% decarbonized or 80% decarbonized like Posco or Hyundai. So every steel company in the world will try to get the same uh, period. You understand? Yeah. So uh, when leaders said 2050, so we will try the same and our company will try the same. Uh, so, thank you very much for, for hearing me. Thank you, Stanislav. And many thanks to all the participants of our today's discussion who joined the discussion by writing the questions. Uh, however, I do not see any questions, but just comments. I would like to ask our experts to comment on each other's speeches. 
Mr. David, Mr. Marx, or Mr. Stanislav. If you like, you may come up with your comments. The floor is yours. Sorry, I, uh, I fully agree that uh, DRI technology, from my subjective side, is uh, more perspective now. But uh, for example, we are a DRI based technology. But uh, for example, we speak with a very interesting uh, USA project. Uh, we are in contact, Boston Metals. Uh, and I know there is existing other uh, projects uh, about electrolyzed uh, production and other type of uh, new technology production of steel, for steel plants. So, and uh, they say that in 2000, uh, uh, in uh, 25, uh, 25, 27, they will try to organize first plants with fully new technology value chain. So, and we will see uh, which technology will, will, will win. It's the most important question, which technology will win uh, uh, in uh, 2030. And about scrap, every expert and World Steel Association said that in future, in 2070, no, not more than 50% of world uh, steel produ production will be based on scrap because scrap is not enough in the world. It's only what I want to add. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Sorry, David. I'm afraid we can't hear you. David, well. I'm sorry, we cannot hear you. Do you hear me? Do you, yes, do you, that's, yes, that's we can. Yeah, sorry, it's, uh, occasionally I just need to reconnect this uh, headset. Uh, known fault. Um, so thank you very much for your interventions. Um, I think what is really crucial in this regard is uh, is to first of all stress that our proposal, of course, at the beginning it it is intended to maintain Ukraine's industrial power. I think that that is important because, of course, as Stanislav said, uh, there would be a, a very very unattractive option, and that is sort of uh, reducing the emissions by reducing the steel sector. And that that of course is not the purpose of what all of these policy proposals aim at. All of these proposals aim at maintaining maintaining economic growth compatible with decarbonization. That, of course, should be the aim. Decarbonization should uh, lead the way to a more attractive future, not to a less attractive one. What is necessary for that, of course, is investment. And I think that's uh, where I would like to stress what I think is somehow the advantage of the uh, policy mix that we uh, propose, because we have an existing investment gap in the Ukrainian steel industry, right? Uh, it is, it's very, uh, very understandable. It's, it's a, an industry with very volatile revenues. It's uh, an industry in a country with very high capital costs, so it's not the only industry in Ukraine that sees too little investment because of the high capital costs. But at the same time, with the pressures coming up, because everyone else is taking this decarbonization very seriously, we see that basically there is the need to modernize, just in terms of modernizing the equipment, and to uh, affect also the decarbonization at the same time. And uh, what we think uh, the the combination of the tax uh, and the fund instrument could do is really do both at the same time. And that I think is that is important because uh, it will be hard to somehow just uh, find a way of supporting investments without creating the revenues. So it's a bit of uh, this this idea of pulling yourself out of the swamp on your own hair that, that we're pursuing here. Um, and that I think is is what is uh, what is so attractive about it that the revenue, the tax revenues coming from the sector itself, are being used to force in a bit more of investment, it, accompanied of course by improving credit conditions and so on. But it is uh, basically also uh, to address this investment gap, which to some extent really is because of the high capital cost, because of the difficult conditions. Maybe it's also uh, to some extent due to part of the ownership structures in the steel sectors. But I think what is really crucial in order to maintain Ukraine's industrial status in the steel sector is to ensure that the investments are there. And that I think is what what, what is kind of nice, but what I really 
like about this proposal that we made. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank yeah. you. Thank Sorry. you. Much, David. Sorry, we're, we're totally out of time at the moment. Dear colleagues, we are extremely grateful to all the participants. Many thanks uh, to our uh, speakers for our today's discussion. We are running out of time and it's uh, of course understandable because uh, uh, we know there's high level of interest over this topic. Uh, topic. And now let me announce please the next part of our discussion. We will be discussing uh, this table call phase out. The presentation will start in about a minute. Hopefully you will stay with us till the end of the discussion. Thank you very much and see you at the next panel. So the presentation, the co phase out should have already started two minutes ago, but let's just wait another minute because the other presentation just uh, finished. Okay, since we do not have that much time, uh, I would start the presentation right now. Um, thank you very much for joining this session on a socially sustainable co phase out in Ukraine. Um, let's get started right away. So, the first question why a co phase out? Then we included this topic in our 10 policy proposals because it's an uh, inevitable step for decarbonizing the Ukrainian economy and the Ukrainian society. Um, coal, so on a global level, there seems to be a global consensus that's co that coal is bad for the environment, of course. So coal is responsible for 30% of uh, global temperature increase. Um, the Ministry of uh, Environmental Protection and Natural Resources just published its second nationally determined contribution. And in this publication, the ministry envisages um, the reduction of primary coal consumption of up to 50 percent by 2030. So this leads us to the next dimension, um, the electricity sector, because the electricity sector will be hit by uh, 50 percent less uh, primary coal consumption. The, in the electricity sector, most uh, thermal and uh, combined heat and power plants are outdated and already exceeded their lifetime. Currently, we have the National Emission Reduction Plan in force. Um, the National Emission Reduction Plan uh, envisages the 
um, retrofitting and as, so the modernization uh, modernization of uh, power plants in Ukraine and is based on EU regulation. Um, however, it is currently in force, but there is clearly a lack of implementation. Um, just last year, the Ministry of Energy um, announced that it tries to postpone um, the uh, implementation of the National Emission Reduction Plan. And so the, the thermal power plant park um, is outdated and will be outdated within the next years, probably. The third dimension is carbon pricing. Um, so the carbon tax was already several times mentioned today. We have a paper on the carbon tax within the 10 policy proposals. Uh, I would invite you to read the paper because there we um, uh, basically uh, propose a carbon tax of up to 39, uh, 39, uh, 39 euros. Uh, by two per ton of CO2 until 2030, which is quite high, but it could be useful in order to avoid the EU carbon border adjustment mechanism. The fourth dimension is energy security. Um, Ukraine was a net exporter of coal. However, today it is a net importer of coal. In 2018, uh, the uh, Ukraine imported 22 megatons of coal and exported 0.09 megatons of coal and 70% of the imports came from Russia. The fifth dimension is unprofitability. So, sorry. So the cost of coal is higher uh, than uh, the selling price. Uh, so most state-owned coal mines, so almost all state-owned coal mines are not profitable and receive high subsidies. And the coal subsidies play a very important role in Ukraine. So the subsidies consist of three parts. It's uh, there are fiscal support subsidies, which are direct budget transfers. We have uh, public finance support, so loans, grants, and guarantees, for example, and there are um, state-owned investment support. In our paper, we calculated the sum of all the three um, uh, support uh, uh, fragments, so to say, and we received for 2019 more than 400 million euros per year are spent for the coal industry or for state-owned coal mines. Um, so assuming um, a gradual phase out until 2030, we would have obtained uh, 1.8 billion euros uh, in savings for the, for the budget. So let us just digest this uh, number for a second. So it becomes quite clear that phasing out coal subsidies would immediately lead to uh, a phase out of coal because most state-owned coal mines, which are uh, approximately 32 at the moment, would go bankrupt quite uh, fast. So what to do? First of all, labor policies. There are mainly three possibilities for former miners. So when a mine closes, there is either the option of retraining retirement or closure activities. Retraining, for example, is for rather young workers who can then enter other industries, also, for example, the re renewable generation industry. Uh, retirement is suitable for workers with an age of up to five years uh, before normal retirement and closure activities of the mine are suitable for, especially for more senior miners. So in the paper, we assigned those three possibilities to the age, age structure of a state-owned coal mine. So at the bottom of the slide, you can see, you can see the age stru structure of miners in state mines in 2020 on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side in 2030. Be aware that these are only the workers in state-owned coal mines. So in private coal mines, there are uh, approximately 40,000 more than that, or even 50,000 more than that. Um, so you can see on the left hand side that uh, most of the workers are between 30 and 50 years old and which is very striking already 25 percent of state-owned coal mine workers um, are already in the pension age so they are not incentivized to actually retire but are still working in the mines on the right hand side you can see assuming a gradual phase out of coal uh, until 2030 you can see that most of the miners would already be in a new occupation. Some of them would work in uh, the decommissioning of the mine, and most of them uh, would already be uh, retired. 
So apart from labor policies, so uh, apart from addressing uh, former miners, there are, in our understanding, three major structural measures uh, to be considered. So first of all, the coal commission, and that's now me talking as a German because we had a coal commission for the lignite phase out and this commission had a clear mandate. Um, it was, uh, ex it existed in order to provide a um, clear development plan for the lignite regions. And it was there in order to give recommendations to the government. And it included all affected stakeholders. So in the coal commission, we had uh, we had representatives from the industry, from the regions, from uh, environmental organizations, and also politicians from the ruling parties at the, at this moment. However, um, the politicians did not have voting rights. Uh, secondly, regional agencies. So there should be complementary to the coal commission. Uh, regional agencies are very helpful in order to um, develop regional plans, since in Ukraine, when we consider all the mines, five regions would be affected. So in the West, we have Lviv region and Volin, and on the, uh, in, in, in the Donbass area, we have Luhansk, Donetsk, and Dnipropetrovsk. Um, I think it's very worthwhile to mention the platform uh, for, for sustainable development in Donetsk. It includes nine towns already. Uh, nine coal towns and the platform accompanies uh, the transformation process in those nine coal towns. And luckily, on the panel today, we have uh, uh, Martin Schönchanishvili, who is uh, one of the creators of the platform, uh, together with uh, Eco Action, just to name a few. And so uh, I would be very glad if you could say, tell us something about uh, this platform. Thirdly, uh, a just transition fund uh, would be suitable. Um, here, the funding could come from, uh, coal, from, from the phasing out of coal subsidies, for example. I already uh, told you that uh, until 2030, 1.8 billion euros could be, um, could be obtained from phasing out coal subsidies. The fund then could provide grants for social and environmental uh, projects and thus uh, unlock private capital and capital from international financial institutions and capital from uh, other international donors. Uh, here it's important to mention that um, there is already an energy efficiency fund in Ukraine. Um, there is currently a debate on a national climate fund in Ukraine, and we think that a third fund addressing the regional development of, uh, of Ukraine during the just transi transition uh, could be very useful. So um, in order to, to finish my, my short presentation, um, I will give you an overview of the current debate on coal transition. So what are the current plans affecting the coal transition? So first of all, we have um, the plan to be climate neutral by 2060. In order to achieve that, uh, coal should be phased out by 2050. Um, DTEC, and this is quite striking, DTEC will exit coal-fired electricity generation by 2040. This is important because uh, just DTEC is responsible for 70% of coal extraction and uh, DTEC operates nine out of the 13 um, uh, thermal power plants. The government announced, or uh, in this case, the Ministry of Energy announced that five to six mines uh, will be closed in 2021. Of course, state-owned coal mines. Uh, the German government um, is uh, currently supporting, uh, will support two of the mine closures the one mine is in Chevonorat in Lviv region, and the other one is in Donetsk in Mirnorat. And for uh, me personally, the, the most interesting decision was, I think it was in January or February, when the Ministry of Energy decided to stop coal subsidies by 2022 and to prepare a detailed phase-out plan uh, by 2022 as well. Um, here it is important to note that there is now a new minister of energy in Ukraine, Mr. Lushenko, and he's currently preparing a new coal strategy for the coal industry and for the coal regions. So um, I, me and my team, we are really looking forward to see this strategy because in our understanding, um, what the, the main takeaway is that, yes, there is awareness in Ukraine, also on the government level, 
Um, and there is the willingness, at least partly, to phase out coal. But for now, Ukraine lacks a comprehensive approach for its long-term coal phase-out strategy. And uh, apart from this um, long-term phase-out strategy, there should also be clear, um, concrete policies in order to accompany those, uh, the strategy. So thank you very much for uh, your attention. Um, I will now give the floor to Simon Unterschütz from the Ministry of Environmental Protection in Germany. in Germany. However, I'm not here in my official role. So I used to work for Low Carbon Ukraine as a project manager and a consultant, and I was uh, asked to provide here the moderation. So I'm happy to be here, but not representing officially the German government, say. I um, feel very honored here and um, to, I believe, The one energy system is to green and renewable energy sources. So, um, but I would say that the topic is much more than about switching the energy source. I mean, it is about the people, the local culture, the identity and history. And it's uh, moreover about the future and prosperity of the people living in those coal regions. And I think those are very important aspects that we are hopefully be able to address today. And I'm, I'm very happy to discuss this topic with our two panelists, with um, Victoria Gnatowska, and I hope I pronounce her name correctly. Uh, she's the acting director general of the Directorate for Energy Resource Efficiency Policy at Minergo. I cannot see you yet. Ah, there you are. <laughs> Hello. And then uh, our second panelist uh, is Martin Schön Shanitvili, a senior advisor at uh, the NGO German Watch. Um, Manuel already mentioned about the platform for sustainable development, and I'm uh, looking forward if we can hear more about that in a second. Um, but I would uh, like to start um, this uh, discussion with a short poll. So I just posted it in the chat. And if you can enter um, the Slido code, it's a 405632. And I will also um, share the screen. Um, I hope you can see it. So um, I have two questions for you to start up the discussion and get a broader perspective of what our audience thinks about the um, so, um, sustainable transition from um, phasing out coal. Um, so I hope you're in there and uh, let's start with the first poll. It is the question is when should Ukraine's coal phase out be completed in your opinion? How much time do we have? When should it be finished? Um, in 2030, five in 2030 2040 or do you think we have time or we should wait until after 24. okay we already have 10 re respondents i think there's more than 100 people here in the audience so um let's wait for another 10 seconds or so Okay, I think there's not much moving anymore. So we have uh, most people aiming for 2035, 2040. Only fewer people, about 20%, think it uh, should be done already by 2030. And uh, I think what you, which is very interesting is to see that only 8% think it should be done after 2040. I think this uh, gives us some food for discussion later. Um, going to the next um, poll, uh, the question is, what are the biggest challenges concerning a socially sustainable coal phase out? Um, so we picked some options here, and I hope you find some that uh, you think are relevant, and you can pick up to three res uh, responses. Okay, so first answers coming in. I mean, I'm gonna read out the, the first two already. So 
we have a tendency towards the creating new business and job opportunities as a major challenge. Now the challenge is funding the transition. Uh, I think it was already brought in in the chat, so we should also definitely discuss that later. Um, organizing the political process and overcoming corruption with uh, about 30%, and then taking care of former miners and lack of returnable energy sources is apparently ranked the lowest. Only 10% think that this is a big issue. Um, okay, I think I'll leave it with this. So we have um, time for our um, discussion. And I'd like to start by um, addressing Martin Schönschanichvili. Um, you have some firsthand experience uh, with the local communities in the, in the local coal regions. So could you tell us a bit about your experience and also what do you see as the biggest challenges when it comes to a just transition in Ukraine? Thank you very much, Simon. Dear colleagues, I will be speaking Ukrainian. Hopefully this won't disturb you i will be making some mistakes this is not my native language however over the past several years i've learned to speak ukrainian so i will do my best thank you very much for these questions for the opportunity to participate in the event and uh, many thanks to the colleagues from lcu they in our opinion do a very important job in terms of the transformation of Ukraine. We, German Watch, is a non-governmental organization in Germany. We are active in many countries. And this project, uh, we, we implement uh, uh, this project together with uh, our Ukrainian partners with the support of the uh, GIZ. Uh, we started dealing uh, with the Eastern Ukraine, Donetsk, uh, Oblast. Uh, we started 3.5 years ago, and at that time it was, uh, so to say, a topic non grata. The call phase out was not very high on the agenda of Ukraine at that time. The situation changed recently. We were really surprised to come up with a number of uh, cities, mining cities in Donetsk Oblast and NGOs and uh, industry chambers that are aware of the challenges. They are aware of the fact that it's important to start working right now. They are ready to uh, join an informal uh, group, the Sustainable Development Platform. I have sent a link to the chat. They, uh, by following this link, you can find uh, the English and Ukrainian versions of their site. Uh, this uh, platform brings together various uh, organizations, uh, sometimes even authorities and uh, the uh, civil sector does not always share the opinion of the authorities, yet it's a normal situation, I believe. Uh, the platform has already come up with the proposals and uh, by the end of uh, summer, they will be ready to present the strategy for the development of coal mining cities. The topics uh, of the projects are very similar to those mentioned by Manuel. The topic number one is uh, education. Uh, the question is, uh, in what specialties the next generation should be trained? There are quite adequate educational facilities in that region. Uh, there are also 
such important topics as uh, energy efficiency and development of cities, urban development of coal mining cities. Uh, personally, I've been uh, dealing with the coal phase out challenges uh, over 12 years. And I can say that in my opinion, in my opinion, the key question in this context is uh, what prospects can be opened in front of people and the regions? So this is the same question as we hear today. What prospects do you do they have? As we ask this question, uh, we oversee, so to say, a mistake enshrined in this question. So we need to give people uh, the prospects. This is a, a unilateral process, but we should make a step backward and uh, consider the principle of subsidiarity. What can be helpful for any region in any country? Namely, the approach that allows to see true challenges at the grassroots level. People should get the solutions and people should get the resources to overcome these challenges. I think that under current situation of decentralization of Ukraine, there is also a decision to cooperate with the EU more closely. These are uh, conducive uh, con uh, conditions for subsidiarity development. And uh, at the same time, it's uh, important not to forget people who've spent their lives working in the mines. This job is very difficult, of course, uh, this job is related to the certain level of income. To the very stable process of uh, organization of labor, so to say. But in the Ukraine, uh, these mines are de facto in very challenging situation since 1990s, since uh, the independence of Ukraine, maybe you are aware of this fact, you've watched the, the film about the history of this movement. So, so this movement of miners, we know about people looking for alternatives, for further prospects, people, are losing sense they are, are losing the sense of their lives and this is actually the existential basis of their lives and now let me share a couple of uh, ideas what can be done to uh, do practical steps apart from uh, discussing this abstract concept of subsidiarity first of all i would say When uh, the government of any state starts this process, it's really expedient to set ambitious goals such as decarbonization. It's essential now because we are in the situation when coal is going to be replaced on the market within uh, the nearest decade. This is not an economic question. The country should be ready to subsidize in this sector in order to keep it afloat. Then uh, we have to, it's important to provide uh, the clear framework for the regions themselves. They should know what to do after the subsidies are lifted and after the coal is phased out. At the same time, 
a certain measure should be taken in advance. At least now, it's important to start working with these regions on the alternatives. When I refer to regions, I think it's important to mention also uh, cooperation between municipalities and between different actors, uh, not only representatives of uh, local civil governments, but also representatives of business, industry and commerce chambers, as well as NGOs. Why am I referring to the cooperation between municipalities? I always tell my colleagues from Donetsk Oblast about very interesting uh, story. My German colleagues and I observe lots of similarities of such uh, processes. Uh, however, people tend to concentrate on uh, the problems which are very uh, close to the heart. And every uh, city mayor, every head of the community is trying to attract as much resources as possible to their own community. However, in the context of the region, it is not expedient. Community, some communities uh, attract business and uh, uh, if it's the case only for three or four communities uh, leaving all the other communities behind it won't be beneficial for entire region then next it is also crucial to establish transparent conditions of financing from both the central budget and uh, from the international organizations. I believe this is a global problem. Our partners, the cities we work with in the east of Ukraine, do not understand in their majority the criteria by which the international partners are guided. It is not clear why the government decides to support this or that particular project. This might be related to some uh, information flows and to a uh, high dynamic of process. Martin, can I stop you at that point? Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for, for that input. And I think you, you touched upon so many aspects already that um, I would like to give the word to Mrs. Gnatowska now to have the chance to respond to some of them. I'm sure we, we won't have enough time to probably um, discuss the whole topic today, but I'd like to hear, uh, yes, your opinion on some of the challenges that, that Martin described. Um, I wrote down my notes, um, definitely showing the prospects to the people in the regions, uh, how to incorporate the, the grassroots focus, how to incorporate a broad range of stakeholders, maybe touch a bit about, uh, touch upon uh, um, education and also the, uh, the question, how can you actually finance that transition? Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm so happy to see you. This topic is highly relevant and I'm very grateful for your studies and the presentation delivered. Let me say that indeed the public sector, mining sector tends to uh, cut off the production uh, to increase the state aid because the state continuously supports uh, coal mines. Uh, there are also such problems as the uh, deaths and social crisis. In terms of uh, numbers, I can say that uh, the production in state-owned mines is uh, no more than 10%. Private mines account for about 90%. Uh, the losses now about 1.6 billion. Today's uh, state aid is uh, 5.3 billion. 
it is uh, clear that uh, the general trends are threatening and uh, due to this fact it uh, is important for ukraine to transform the coal mining sector and to develop the state policy for social adaptation of uh, miners and their families the the minister of energy works on these problems in spite of um, changing the leadership at the ministry the structural units in charge uh, continue developing uh, the documents such as the draft concept for transformation of uh, coal mining sector. The goal of this uh, concept is to reduce the coal mining down to the economically feasible uh, amounts to satisfy the needs of uh, Ukrainian consumers and uh, to ensure Ukraine's energy independence. Uh, the draft uh, concept has been already approved by the uh, central executive authorities. The concept also envisages adoption of the action plan. We as a ministry audited uh, the coal mines at our level. However, I believe this uh, audit should be more in-depth. Uh, we do need uh, this uh, complete audit of the state-owned mines to understand uh, the level of uh, profitability and the consumption of uh, resources, their expenditures, so we should be clear about the current status in order to avoid losses, it is uh, planned to introduce the uh, vertically integrated uh, companies. We also raise the issue of the full-scale privatization. Uh, the mines uh, that won't be sold at auctions will be subject to close down. And uh, we are in the final stage of uh, negotiations with the new leader of the ministry. Maybe there will be some additional discussions aimed at finalizing this concept. At the same time, we are working together with Ministry of uh, Regions. With them, we discuss the transformation of regions after the mines are closed down. And uh, transformation should be fair uh, because uh, we are guided by the regional model uh, by the model of regional development, ensuring uh, the uh, decent uh, standard of living for those who uh, rely on their jobs in the sector of mining. Uh, many international partners from German, from Great Britain, from Poland uh, have shared their experience, have started their practices. We are already selecting uh, some mines that will be used uh, for piloting transformation processes in the regions. There are still issues, of course, about uh, financing, about uh, the immediate mechanisms, about uh, the further use of uh, coal produced. Coal is used, for instance, for production of heat. Uh, Personally, I am in charge of energy efficiency direction, and we um, discuss some projects aimed at the energy efficiency of uh, combined uh, power plants. And uh, at the moment, we've got the mechanisms developed together with the Danish Center Decarbonization Fund. Together with them, uh, we've uh, discussed the increase of carbon tax, of CO2 tax. And uh, we uh, consider uh, the use of this tax for modernization of uh, the sector, including the generation facilities, in order to reduce CO2 emissions. I think it's a highly, it's a highly important mechanism I'd like to say also that uh, I'm 
the member of uh, the transparency initiative in the mining sector this is one of the sectors that uh, pays uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, taxes we've uh, uh, get the secretariat of uh, the initiative and uh, at the level of the secret secretariat to discuss the, the use of the taxes paid by the coal mining sector for the development of uh, the regions. Um, Mrs. Knotowska, I would like to interrupt you at that point. I'm very sorry. It is very difficult to get into a smooth conversation here online, but uh, I I'm, thank you very much for showing all those aspects that you're already doing with the government. Um, I'd like to get in, try to have the last five minutes a bit more conversation. So I would give uh, the word again to, to Martin and maybe you can think of just one measure that you would like the, the Ukrainian government to implement and something they can do immediately and that they should do next month, ideally. And then I would like to uh, hear uh, if uh, Mrs. Gnatowska, what, what do you think of that? And if there's possibility, uh, Martin. It's a very good question. If I had a good answer, I would uh, be working as a special advisor of different governments in Europe long ago. Specifically in the Ukrainian situation, I think uh, we need to clarify what Victoria has just mentioned in the concept of transformation. Uh, to make this sector ambitious, understandable, and give it a plan that will allow all players to participate in this. That's one thing. Another thing, um, I would like to put down at the same table There is a, a center for transformation and it's a nice format and against the current background, I would step it up. And I would suggest to host such common discussions as to how we can do this together. So our government also risks to be, let's say, always be beaten whatever they do they will still be the ones to blame the blame will still be laid on them because there are lots of stakeholders and it's very important to start the process of cooperation with different parties okay in Thank a transparent much, manner <laughs> i'd like to give the word uh, then to tu. Knatowska. we only have three minutes left unfortunately but maybe you have the a good response a golden solution to martin's uh, comments and uh, yeah, I give the word back to you. Well, I fully agree that the concept of development of coal regions has to be this first and foremost task and the implementation of plan of measures according to the plan of measures it's not just the ministry that's responsible for it there are lots of uh, executive authorities that are responsible and they have to implement this concept it has to ensure stage by stage development of the regions um, decommissioning of coal and uh, it shouldn't have a shock effect on the regions subject to transformation besides that i also believe that we need to introduce some pilot projects and pilot projects are going to serve as an example for other regions and we need to start somewhere so first of all we need to introduce a strategic document, a concept, um, adopt it, implement a plan of measures, and introduce pilot projects stage by stage 
for the development of the regions. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Knatowska. Uh, I think that's a very good uh, final remark that you mentioned here. Unfortunately, our time is up now. We have so many more questions in the chat that I wasn't even able to um, pick up. Um, but uh, this shows there is so much more need for discussion. And I hope uh, that uh, all you can can take uh, take uh, have some key takeaways also from the questions in the chat and uh, yeah continue the discussion in in other forms and uh, again i'd like to thank you very much and then we will have the next uh, session starting soon so all the best to you thank you thank very you, much dear colleagues thank you Otto. Hello, dear colleagues. I'm Olena Rybak. I'm an advisor to see consulant uh, in Ukraine. And uh, uh, I think we have three more minutes until the start. We can wait if somebody wants to join us later. Let's just wait for a couple of minutes and we'll start if everybody's happy with it. Okay, we can see colleagues coming up. Frank, are you ready? Sorry, um, Elena, I will give the presentation. So I wrote the paper with Frank together. I will give the presentation until he will be uh, uh, on the panel afterwards with, uh, with the discussions. Then I would suggest that we start. We have a chat here where you can ask questions. You can also ask your questions through Slido and I will send you the link where you can do that and our colleagues will help us moderate. Um, with if there are questions in online broadcasts on Facebook and in other open platforms. But we'll try to go through questions. First, we will have a presentation, then a discussion, and I will try to share a few questions on Slido. We have about 70 participants at the moment. Let's collect a bit of statistics. So let's have uh, some fruitful discussion. I'm looking forward to your questions. The floor goes to Manuel to start. Thank you. So, uh, sorry. Thank you very much, Elena, for the kind introduction. Uh, can you all see the slides and hear me? Perfect. Thank you very much. So, uh, I'm very glad to see there's so many people joining this session on uh, energy efficiency in public buildings, 50% retrofitting target until 2030. Um, I wrote this paper together with my colleague, Dr. Frank Meisner, uh, who you will be uh, on the panel afterwards, after the presentation. 
So let's start with uh, a quote from uh, the Kiev Post, just uh, I think it was nine days ago, yeah, nine days ago, uh, World Bank to provide 200 million US dollars to renovate Ukraine's universities. So there are a variety of uh, international financial institutions in Ukraine currently um, investing in public buildings, uh, the EBRD, EIB, and obviously the World Bank, just to name a few. Um, public the public building infrastructure is a um, very important backbone for perceiving state tasks. So if buildings fail to provide their considered services adequately, the quality of state services are affected negatively. So in our view, view there are uh, energy efficiency retrofitting of public buildings creates a win-win situation. So on the one hand, we have an improvement of basic building specific, specific services, on the other hand, we have an improvement of energy efficiency. So I would like to um, always get into the motivation of the paper. So why did we include it in our 10 policy proposals? So the, first of all, the um, public building stock or the general building stock in uh, Ukraine is outdated. Um, deferred uh, repair investment uh, reduces the value of, um, of the Ukrainian building stock. So there are usually low energy efficiency classes in the buildings when we can see high energy consumption and large um, uh, greenhouse gas uh, contributions. And the poor physical condition of um, the building stock is amplified by uh, the absence of metering and a lack of thermostats. So they are in general economically inefficient to put it in a nutshell. So this has of course a negative impact on the basic building specific services. In order to evaluate um, the retrofitting of public buildings, we have six dimensions and uh, you can see them uh, at the bottom of the screen, but we will uh, talk about them in more detail a little bit later. So in our paper, we propose an ambitious energy efficiency retrofitting of 50% of public buildings, of the public building stock until 2030. Uh, this means, or this includes six, uh, approximately 16 million square meters per year, or 5,500 public buildings per year. Um, we expect uh, the following effects until 2030. Uh, primary energy savings will amount to 2,300 kilotons of oil equivalent, and, and there will be emission reductions of approximately 5 uh, megatons of CO2 per year. And we expect uh, the following investment needs amounting to uh, approximately 10 billion euros. Uh, the investment needs are needed for uh, the investments are needed for, for example, insulation of walls, roofs, or the attic, but also um, the modernization of uh, the building system, such as hot water uh, heating system or cooling system. So now on the assessment of the effects. So as I said already, we have six dimensions. The first dimension is energy security. So retrofitting public buildings would lead to a lower gas consumption, um, approximately 70 um, billion cubic meters over the 10 years. Uh, we would have less energy imports and uh, it is a hedge against price fluctuations and or supply shortages. shortages sorry. The second dimension is the internal energy market. So the modernization of uh, the buildings enables uh, so-called price sensitivity of demand. So if you install uh, a metering system or uh, uh, thermostats, there's a more economical behavior of the consumers of the energy. The third dimension is quite obvious, it's energy efficiency. It's the key target of uh, energy efficiency retrofitting, of course. So in the paper, we calculate improvements of um, energy efficiency in public buildings ranging between 20 to 70 percent, uh, surely depending on the size or the type of the building and the, the in initial energy class. Furthermore, we calculated uh, energy consumption per square meters. Um, we see a reduction of up to 100 to 200 kilowatt hours per square meter. And we have, um, when we assume 
uh, annual 16 million uh, square meters renovated until 2030, 19,000 gigawatt hours would uh, be saved. The fourth dimension is decarbonization. So annual additional emission reductions of 0.6 megaton CO2 per year can be expected. Um, in general, this is around 2% of current national emissions. So obviously, this is not uh, the overall effect is not very big, but this is due to the low share of public buildings in the building stock in Ukraine. So but this brings us to the next topic. Obviously, the residential sector is way bigger than the public building sector. So why starting even with the public building stock? So according to us, or in our opinion, um, the uh, public building stock can be seen as a, as, as kind of a, um, a training ground or a good example for the residential sector. So it increases the learning effect and with increasing skills in the construction sector, um, the aggregated retrofitting cost will decrease. Furthermore, we expect um, green business models arising along uh, the value chain. The sixth dimension is socioeconomic co-benefits and government expenditure or the increase of governmental demand can be seen as a demand side stimulus. And so um, uh, there, are, there, there will be direct and indirect effects on employment in Ukraine. Uh, we expect uh, employment effects amounting to 50,000 new jobs in the value chain. The, and of course, an improvement of the basic building specific services. So for example, in a hospital, um, if hospitals have a higher comfort, uh, it increases the well-being of uh, the patients. And therefore, um, we, we see that as a socioeconomic co-benefit of retrofitting public buildings. This is our calculation. So we expect total investments uh, amounting to 9.6 billion euros until 2030. But it is important to mention that we also expect uh, monetary savings, monetary energy savings um, until 2020, uh, 2059, um, amounting to 24 billion euros. So one can say that um, investing into um, the public building stock pays off in the end. And just to conclude the presentation, it is important to note that um, just to, to put it in a nutshell, the money is there. Uh, people, investors are always looking for new possibilities to, to, to finance this, uh, to, to finance energy efficiency measures and to use green bonds as we did in our calculation uh, can be very beneficial. Just the main obstacle right now in our opinion is um, the, uh, the high country risk of Ukraine. And so I give the floor uh, back to you, Elena. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Okay, Elena, I apologize. Could you please speak in English channel? Okay. 
retrofitting projects in Ukraine. Uh, and then also uh, any any um, uh, comments uh, from uh, Mr. Meisner. Uh, so Konstantin, shall we start briefly with you? Uh, let's try to, to keep the initial remarks uh, uh, short, <laughs> short, uh, some five minutes or so. And, uh, and so we have time to, to exchange some questions. Thank you. Don't forget about the link. <laughs> Yes, sure. Elena, thank you. Uh, Manuel, thank you for most uh, audience. Uh, it's Ukrainian. So uh, if you allow, I will go in Ukrainian. First of all, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the state agency on energy efficiency many thanks to those who contributed to organization of this event the study presented today is highly important it reflects 10 particular measures to achieve energy and climate goals of ukraine Actually, our uh, global goal, global target of our state is decarbonization. Decarbonization is the, the top priority of the global development in general. Ukraine should keep the pace uh, with the rest of the world and uh, should focus uh, on decarbonization. Uh, we have undertaken uh, to achieve uh, uh, climate goals, energy efficiency goals under the association agreement and under the Paris agreements. We also uh, should be uh, approaching the European Green Deal. One of the tools of decarbonization is uh, interagency, intersectoral approach uh, toward energy efficiency, especially energy efficiency in buildings. Uh, the uh, one third of uh, energy consumption uh, is accounted for by uh, the uh, households, uh, and uh, all the rest is consumed by uh, the industry and uh, other consumers, uh, such as, for instance, uh, administrative or public buildings. Uh, the projects have to be implemented uh, first of all and foremost in the administrative buildings uh, because they can be used as uh, paragons. Uh, these uh, uh, budget, these public uh, buildings are subject to energy certification. Uh, it, it becomes mandatory on uh, uh, in July this year. Uh, over 1,000 buildings have already undergone this uh, energy certification. They are mainly administrative public buildings and they have huge potential to save energy. Uh, regarding training of energy auditors, because uh, energy certification should be based on proper skills, we've got 30 educational establishments that train energy auditors together with GIZ we're developing the qualification framework for these um, educational programs to train the auditors. So the process is underway. It is worth mentioning that uh, our goal is also to achieve a, a zero consumption uh, buildings and uh, they can be uh, achieved uh, to follow the relevant decree by the Ministry of Energy. Hopefully this decree will be approved uh, as soon as possible and uh, this uh, decree will lay the foundation for new class of energy efficiency. This uh, class will be uh, and as that, uh, very nice to hear uh, the mention of green bonds during this event last year. Um, 
a law was launched uh, which defines the concept of green bonds that they can be sovereign corporate and uh, municipal ones uh, we believe at the energies of uh, energy efficiency that uh, each of these category of bonds can be issued in ukraine at the same time it would be worth focusing on municipal uh, bonds together with giz we are working on developing criteria for uh, green projects. What's a green bond actually? In fact, it's a, a regular bond. Uh, it, uh, uh, such bonds can be reduced only on project, uh, can be uh, uh, channeled on the two projects aimed at reducing CO2 or increasing energy efficiency. So the funds are allocated to energy efficiency. That's the one thing. And the second thing, those who procure these bonds are entitled to getting reports on a CO2 a reduction. We at the Energy, of energy Efficiency are currently working on the concept that will provide the algorithm for issuing and verification of green bonds okay so it's possible to issue a lot of bonds uh, yet the verification here is crucial so what are the ways to ensure that uh, the bonds comply with the green criteria the work is underway and we are ready to cooperate with municipalities to pilot some projects aimed at green bonds thank you once again that was information from me a very nice study and very good very interesting event thank you constantine let me clarify uh, do you have any idea of uh, timelines when our municipalities will be able to use these products we are urging the municipalities to uh, get down to the pilot projects uh, right, right now. Uh, we are ready to help municipalities with these pilot projects, of course. And um, as I mentioned, there is a concept of green bonds. The concept is in place. It is. Uh, it has been already submitted to the cabinet of ministers, and uh, I think that. Uh, the decision can be made by the government in June. In February, by the way, this cabinet was uh, approved on the uh, respective government committee. To be realistic, I think it will be possible to say that uh, by the end of the year, the projects related to green bonds can be launched. So you believe that it's uh, possible to more modernize and retrofit 50% of um, administrative buildings until 2030? Yes, I, I believe. Thank you for uh, being optimistic. The question to you, Ima, do you believe that uh, this is a realistic goal? What should be done and uh, uh, what are the activities of GIZ? Good afternoon. I was going to speak English, however, we can select between the languages. Elena, could you consult what language should I use? As far as I know, if you are willing to speak English, you have to select the channel, the English channel. It doesn't matter which language to speak, actually. Over the past 12 years at GIZ, I've been working on energy efficiency programs. I'm very pleased to work with you to study the experience acquired by Berlin Economics with the support of BMU. That's a high quality professional product which they developed as usual we know each other many years in this uh, uh, study they've analyzed uh, the technical as well as regulatory measures which can be implemented so this is a really high quality product what should i say it is uh, important to do something we should consider our efforts and we should of course 
assign the um, agency in charge. All the buildings should be split into some categories depending on the form of ownership and the programs should be targeted depending on these categories. The government uh, can offer such uh, support as a, a fund of uh, energy efficiency. Uh, then uh, it is also possible to attract funds from the uh, European donors. There are lots of people, lots of financial institutions that are ready to support us. And what are bottlenecks, weak points? There are lots of them. Our colleagues from Berlin Economics have outlined these problems, and we know about them as well. Both you, Elena, and me, and many colleagues working with municipalities and implementing projects, pilot projects as we call them, they are aware of these problems. At the moment, by the way, these projects are not pilot anymore. Lots of uh, uh, schools and kindergartens have been uh, retrofitted. They've uh, undergone the thermal um, renovation, thermal modernization. However, of course, lots of work lies ahead of us. We need to more skilled project entitled uh, Problem of Energy Efficiency and Implementation this project Uh, so we have uh, Яким ми зробили разом з мінрегіоном, встановили пілот там відремонтували, реконструювали систему опалення, встановили таку сучасну систему моніторингу, встановили таку ж сонячні панелі на будівлі. Я думаю, ви бачили їх, якщо проходили мимо цієї будівлі, так? І це було дуже багато проблем з реалізацією такого роду проекту, але ж ми пишаємося тим, що ми розробили спеціальний документ такий, де ми ми описали бар'єри, з якими ми зіткнулися і також які шляхи ми використовували для того, щоб Ну, до речі, довести цей проект до фіналу. І ми також надали рекомендації Мінрегіону, які нормативні акти треба допрацювати, і вже є перші кроки, там, де ми вже разом зняли ці бар'єри. І, до речі, от телефонував заступник міністра Лазинський, який запрошував на наступний вівторок, я також запрошую вас прийняти участь. Будемо презентувати проект закону про сприяння показової комплексної термомодернізації. Я хочу сказати, що, що дуже багато чого робиться, але ж треба ще більше, більше, більше. Потрібно більше інструментів, більше спеціалістів. Ми працюємо вже з 43 новими муніципалітетами. В 2008 році ми розпочинали з чотирьох, зараз у нас вже 43. Допомоги для України дуже багато. Енергоменеджмент вже став таким звичним інструментом для наших громад, що не може нас не робити дуже радими і, так, і пишатися цією роботою. Ми вже відкрили нові компоненти. Це також результат нашої роботи. І рецентно ми вважали новий компонент, наприклад, the um, professional development. We have uh, three hubs uh, in Kharkiv, Dnipro and the Chernivtsi to train professionals for this sphere because we know that one of the largest problems is related to the personnel, to the staff. We need professional architects, uh, designers, uh, uh, constructors who can uh, deliver this job. We uh, 
have lots of money surrounding us, but Ukraine should be able to absorb this money for this purpose. It's important to have a kind of an army of skilled professionals. Uh, we are continuing our cooperation with the Minister of Education and uh, started working with colleges and uh, vocational training schools. It's uh, uh, really essential to implement a comprehensive program of measures. Uh, we've also promoted uh, the development of national database. And now it uh, includes uh, 500,000 various indicators. Uh, we need this big data about uh, thermal modernization. The article number five stipulates also that uh, uh, the country has uh, the obligation, not just desire, to implement uh, the article number five. And uh, a certain percentage of the buildings, according to the event released, uh, should be subject to retrofitting. Unfortunately, Ukraine is uh, still not clear about the buildings that are going to be included into this event released. Uh, we've uh, started negotiations uh, with the government under Vice Prime Minister of uh, Zuko. Now we continue negotiations with uh, Mr. Chernyshov. Lots of colleagues participate in the development of this database. Uh, the database includes 13,000 of public buildings uh, from all the regions of Ukraine. And let me remind you about this 500,000 of indicators. This is a huge uh, analytical base uh, for a developing strategy of thermal modernization. Um, partially, uh, the buildings can be retrofitted at the expense of uh, loans uh, or due to the national budget, uh, the big construction program and so on. But it's important to know which buildings are subject to uh, modernization for this purpose. Uh, we need modern digital monitoring. And in this respect, a GIZ uh, can be also very helpful for our government so we cooperate in this respect thank you Political will. Our country is facing a great deal of challenges. War, decarbonization, energy poverty, and so on. So we have to rely on a very powerful team working on a daily basis. As I have said, I'm really... Um, pleased with the situation around our municipalities. Uh, they participate even in competitions to become partners of GIZ. Uh, we've selected 43 municipalities, but we've got over 200 applications. It's important because we see the understanding at all levels. Uh, we cannot expect uh, that uh, our government will uh, make a decision and this uh, energy efficiency will be implemented overnight. Unfortunately not. Uh, this goal requires great efforts from each of us. As soon as we recognize this, as soon as we stop uh, hoping for some marvels, uh, for some wonders, uh, the sooner we will be able to achieve this ambitious goal. So life will make its adjustments. We should uh, set the ambitious goals. Thank you. Okay, thank you for such a positive attitude. Mr. Meissner, as you were preparing this document and your experience, what do you think is uh, the most important for Ukraine to achieve this goal? 
I have seen you work on this. Uh, um, in your experience, who should we set in as an example to achieve this goal? Thank you. Thank you, Elena. First of all, thank you, Ima and Konstantin, for the supporting um, comments. Well, um, as we explained in our publication, um, from our perspective, currently the most critical um, points are, on the one hand, uh, skills of um, of building um, um, of working uh, stuff. Um, as well as the question whether there are uh, clear certificates um, in the system to have a clue on uh, how many energy each specific building is consuming. Um, as Konstantin explained, uh, both, both challenges are addressed by the state agency. So um, this is somehow the, the the frame uh, that uh, Ukraine have to build up to um, develop the environment for uh, starting with such an ambitious, of course, retrofitting project. Um, starting with pilot projects would allow for uh, training in the, in the field, on the one hand, uh, training in direct skills, so how to retrofit such a building, but it, on the other hand, enables to uh, learn how to implement um, such uh, broader um, retrofitting strategies into different um, regional uh, administrative levels and how to implement it in an international discussion or in an international um, uh, finance market. So, you ask me what are the most critical points. In my opinion, it's it's um, it's uh, the training of of uh, workforce um, and um, the raising funding for this uh, activities. Um, as we calculated, we uh, end up with around about ten billion uh, euro of investment within ten years, which is of course a, a huge number. On the other hand. Um, we have seen uh, green bonds raised by above 250 billion euro uh, uh, dollar sorry worldwide uh, in 2019 and 30% of this green bonds uh, went into renovation of buildings um, in parallel to that uh, europe um, has a large program of of uh, money creation not at least uh, forced by the Corona crisis. So uh, we expect that in the uh, coming years, we will see a lot of capital searching for uh, potential funding options. Um, and Ukraine, from our perspective, uh, should to use this momentum. On the one hand, uh, raising awareness of the need for for green investments, and on the other hand, the ability of uh, uh, raising uh, or uh, um, using such uh, uh, money in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meissner. We have several questions. I think Kima and Kostiantin can answer them and comment perhaps on that. And perhaps uh, Mr. Meissner has also mentioned the issue of training of the workforce and the companies. What's happening now, Ima mentioned that there is a program, but um, can anyone assess the gap in the market among building companies to make sure that renovation goes uh, in a dynamic manner? And second issue is energy management. Will this renovation process uh, be retrofitting process go in parallel or will it allow the introduction of energy management energy monitoring system in parallel uh, will um, the technologies of heat pumps be tested i think giz and Kostiantin may have lots of comments 
and Ima can perhaps answer primarily. Thank you for this question. You are demonstrating the top professional knowledge in this field. The Ministry of the Regions has been working on this in many years. In developing the order for the Ministry of Regions or perhaps for another, regulate, uh, another regulatory document, there's a lot of discussion what sort of document it should be that would make uh, uh, energy management in the city is compulsory because we all, we're all professionals here. We all understand that uh, nothing's going to happen without it. Without this, we cannot demand a serious professional attitude towards this process. For 12 years now, we've been working on uh, establishing, on uh, making the cities understand how to do that and establish some monitoring procedures. But at the moment, the regional buildings and other 54 buildings in different ministries, well, we have set up the monitoring for them. They're getting information about their consumption of water, electricity. But what's important is using this data to analyze the situation and uh, for decision making. On a professional level, based on the prior information, and for that purpose, we need some professional facility managers for every building. And this is a lot of work, which also needs to be done. And within our qualification component, we are now working on this, and not only energy management, but also facility management. We're training the trainers. We're training teachers and experts who can prepare this army of experts for us that we dream to have now. We've also established the platform of energy efficiency. I will send the link uh, to chat. There's a lot of information there already in different areas and different fields. Now we also um, did a public opinion poll for entrepreneurs. Residents of Ukraine in energy efficiency so that they could give us some information as to how they can see energy efficiency, who is responsible, and there are lots of interesting figures there. I think you're going to like this platform. Thank you, Kostantin, are you with us? Yes, perhaps he dropped out. On my behalf, oh, okay, he's there. Yes, I'm here, sorry, I have another meeting in parallel, running in parallel. So we're multitasking here, so I'm here. We were briefly discussing, well, Ima has already answered about the training to generate enough experts in the field. And there was a question about energy management systems. Uh, will the um, renovation of uh, state buildings be an energy monitoring accompanied by energy monitoring criterion? And uh, the Ministry of Energy Efficiency used to have a database of experts, of energy managers, energy auditors, I think. Uh, what do you think is the labor market there? Uh, GIZ also works with building companies. Are there any developments there to expand on the circle of competencies? Right, there are plans. Uh, we have to understand that energy audits are a market. Ukraine has more than 1,400 auditors who have been through training, who got their qualification, got their certificates, passed respective tests, and so on. You also have to understand that starting from December 1 last year, online platform construction GovUA started working. And this platform now has a personal cabinet where energy auditors can upload their energy audits. And then energy state agency for energy efficiency, according to our functions, can monitor this. 
provide uh, primary monitoring and deeper secondary monitoring of energy certifications. And I have to say that the quality of energy certification is always high. Not all of the certificates pass deep in-depth secondary checkup. And here I'd like to call upon all energy auditors to make sure that, well, you should do your job properly. Again, we're going back to the point that this is a market. And among other things, this is also about the reputation of those energy auditors. By the way, if the energy audit is not passed twice, does not pass secondary um, assessment twice, the energy auditor has to take a retest. I may say an unpopular thing, but uh, the staff control of energy audits is now very necessary because energy audit is the foundation for further measures. And if we fail with their energy audit, uh, if we set up uh, improper energy data, all of the following work can uh, be nullified. So quality of energy audits is important. Together with GIZ, we're working on making sure we can develop new criteria uh, to enhance the training of the people uh, conducting energy audits. So here is my answer. Thank you, Question Tin. I would like to remind everyone once again that you can ask questions. Uh, we have if about may, 10 Elena, minutes left. If, if I may, Elena, I would like to add one thought. Um, the points Ima and Konstantin uh, explained are very important uh, to frame um, or to, to uh, build the, the frame on that uh, the uh, retrofitting uh, initiative is, uh, is able to work. Um, in addition to that, from my perspective or our perspective, it's necessary to, to uh, build up the expectations of building companies. Um, meaning that um, as soon as building companies uh, can expect that this is an ongoing and long going uh, retrofitting strategy in Ukraine, they will come up with own uh, business models and with own ideas how to enter the market. So um, to all that, it's necessary to, to have a, a good communication of what is Ukraine doing and what are the, what are the um, um, advantages uh, Ukraine uh, uh, strive for. Um, yeah. So just one remark. Thank you. I actually wanted to remind you that uh, we can still ask questions. We have about 10 minutes left. Let's add to this because I did a presentation for the cities yesterday that are introducing energy efficiency programs. And in my list, the problem of uh, quality building companies who can um, take the tender and pass the tender and see the perspectives is huge. Because very few of these companies actually want to work with municipal programs, with budget programs, with international funding. And then with um, um, condominium owners associations, they still don't feel this market very well. Mr. Meister said that we need to sort of generate the expectations of the sector of um, service suppliers so that they could adjust to that. But for now, the interest is there. The competition and the biddings is there. Well, it, but it's pretty modest. It's not like there's a lot of agitation about it. Um, those of you who haven't answered the questions yet, we don't have that many optimists and pessimists. Well, 53 by 47, 53, slight predominance of uh, pessimists. But the difference isn't big, and that's a good um, ground for optimism. Also, almost 50-50, let's hope. If you allow me a short comment, uh, 
towards those who believe in energy efficiency, well, we all believe in energy efficiency, it was probably best to start with it. That we all have to understand that energy efficiency is beneficial. It's profitable. It's not just an investment in our future and so on. Uh, investment in energy independence and everything, but energy efficiency measures are actually measures that pay off pretty quickly. I may shift the focus in a different direction, but you may have sensed it in the credit model and analysis shows that we have cases where after um, energy efficiency measures, private buildings or condominium owners associations started paying four times less for um, natural gas or other resources. So they started paying less and these are the measures that can pay off in less than one heating season. I'm not talking about comprehensive upgrade of uh, public buildings, the payback period is uh, somewhat higher there, but these things can really pay off quickly. And this is not a fantasy, this is an absolute reality and we have to understand that. Somebody wanted to say something? Mr. Meister, a, sh a short question about the actual study. And the goal, why was the goal only set for uh, uh, public buildings? Why, did, why wasn't residential funds taken into account? Well, we, we just concentrated on different topics. And um, as you probably know, Berlin Economics uh, is and was supporting the Energy Efficiency Fund with uh, several calculations and uh, support in the implementation. Um, there's no other big, big reason for just concentrating on, on uh, public buildings. However, what we see is that in, pub in public buildings, the economic efficiency seems to be much higher than in residential buildings. Um, and uh, we do not face the problem of uh, homeowner associations that have to uh, accept such retrofittings. So we expect that it's more easy to implement uh, a big investment uh, plan into public buildings. Ima? Yes, I'd like to comment on that as well. First of all, you're raising very good questions, Olen. And secondly, what Frank said was very important. As a country, oh, we can count on our property and make decisions about our property. Uh, if we talk about public buildings today, we can say, okay, we are taking a loan and we are deciding on that. Uh, we cannot do the same for private property or for condominiums. We can only do facilitation uh, as energy efficiency fund or warm loans program. It's important that everybody forms a position of uh, personal responsibility for their own property. Secondly, if we have a minute, I would like to tell about another new initiative of the government of Germany. Our country is participating in the energy partnership and the working group on energy efficiency will be sitting later today, meeting later today. Mr. Gura is going to be present there as well. And it's a very important tool of coordination of the government of Germany because all three or five German ministries that are participating in support for Ukraine are coordinating their activity with all ministries involved in this field. And energy partnership is not only working in Ukraine, and not only in the countries that require assistance, but also with Canada, with Japan. And it's a very interesting tool. I welcome joining this uh, process. I'm very glad Ukraine joined. 
Besides energy efficiency, there are five big areas. Transformation of coal regions, which we're also starting to work on soon. Uh, hydrogen, decarbonization within the framework of this energy partnership from Berlin Economics is working on decarbonization, for instance, and there are sustainable energy systems there. And our favorite, green generation. These are five key areas. So I welcome this idea and uh, that we have joined our green partnership. And I hope this tool can also help Ukraine achieve those ambitious goals. Thank you, Ima. We have several minutes left and we have two questions rising. One related to the pandemic and employers. That employers started reviewing the number of office workers and how that will be related to energy efficiency. Frankly speaking, as a representative of the company that supplies all sorts of engineering services and matters of energy efficiency, we've only grown over these years because we have more and more work coming. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, you have other experience, so please share that. And another question is probably perhaps to more to Konstantin Hura. How can Ukraine further develop ESCO market? The European Union is doing a lot for this development and for this funding, we have briefly mentioned that, but are there any other major plans on the subject? Well, ESCO is a fantastic tool because this is when uh, budget buildings can get energy modernization without the use of budget funds. This is good for business because this guarantees return of investments in line with the legislation. We have 550 ESCO agreements, but there is one but there. Uh, last year, the law on energy efficiency was mentioned and ESCO cannot buy this now, cannot be procured now. There is draft law and we know this problem very well. There is draft law that has been registered in Parliament uh, last year. Now, there are two alternative draft laws. And they are deblocking ESCO and they are spreading ESCO for um, energy supply, energy efficiency. And our position in the agency is unchanged. ESCO is great. It should be scaled up in Ukraine. And in order to make this happen in practice, uh, the parliament needs to adopt one of those draft laws that is already registered in the parliament. We very much hope that our committee can provide its support. And sec first and second reading can be, well, this draft laws can be adopted and they can deblock multi-billion multi market. We hope these draft laws are passed and we're ready to further support ESCO projects in every way in Ukraine. And perhaps last uh, short question to Mr. Meissner. The document and recommendations and what do you think should happen next in the ideal world? Where should those recommendations go further and these policy proposals? Who should start handling them so that they'd started moving further so that Ukraine could make some progress? There's a big audience here. Well, um, as Ima and Konstantin uh, uh, reported, um, some of our uh, proposals, um, for instance, uh, training sessions uh, are already implemented. Um, 
I guess uh, starting with single projects uh, uh, to increase learning curve uh, would be the best way to step into the whole topic and then we will see an evolutional process uh, learning by doing um, and of course uh, uh, we will not see 10% uh, or 20% of whole amount of, of, of buildings uh, retrofitted within the next one year. Um, but we have to enter a tra trajectory that by the end of this decade, um, maybe we reach the 50%, 50% right. Thank you. Is there anyone willing to share some final comments? Seems that no. Then, on my behalf, I would like to thank all the participants, authors, speakers, the audience for your ideas, for your comments. All the policy proposals are published on the Low Carbon Ukraine website. Our event has been recorded in both languages and uh, these uh, recordings will be very soon available. If you are willing to share, you are welcome to do so. All the participants will get the feedback form and the organizers will appreciate any kind of feedback you might provide. Thank you very much. I wish you a nice day and a very nice energy initiatives. Thank you for this moderation. Thank you, see you. Thank you, Elena. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.